Добрый день, дамы и господа. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Distinguished participants of the forum, we welcome the participants of our session. Before we start, I'd like to thank the Euro Eurasian Club of Scientists and sponsors of today's event for this possibility to have a discussion on topical issues such as uh, shaping the future using tools of industry for all transforming smart cities. Modern cities are centers of culture, trade, science, education, but uh, they have a large number of economic, social, and environmental challenges. And the solving of these problems is possible thanks to the transition to smart cities, to a green economy. And I'd like to emphasize that smart cities are one of the important constituent issues within the framework of the fourth industrial revolution, which imply the optimization of the entire life of the city. There are today more connected devices in the world than people. According to forecasts, by 2022, they will exceed more than 20 billion. As Internet of Things technologies continue to spread in all aspects of everyday life and are even introduced into the human body, issues related to data ownership, cybersecurity, accuracy, and privacy protection are becoming increasingly relevant and important. All these issues will be discussed at our session titled Shaping the Future, Application of Industry for All Tools, Transformation of Smart Cities. At the session, our speakers will talk about ongoing initiatives for the development of cities and regions. And uh, representatives of the World Economic Forum, local executive bodies, as well as public and international companies will share their vision projects and solutions. Before I start, I'd like to share with you several forecasts of IDC this week. They announced the forecast for 2022, uh, which relates to smart cities and communities. And uh, I'd like to start the presentation. Uh, one second, please. I'll show you what uh, we in IDC uh, see uh, today and what our forecasts are in terms of smart cities. My name is Andrei Beklemishev, and I work in IDC company in the CIS department. I'll moderate this session, and I'd like to show you our key forecasts uh, related to smart cities. I have only one slide, but it's uh, very informative. Uh, we have here 10 key forecasts of IDC that uh, our experts uh, who are located uh, in different parts of the world uh, see today and what we forecast for the following five years as well all uh, are in detail described here but i won't speak about each one of them i'd like you to pay attention to the picture uh, and uh, to the terms of forecasts and from 2022 to 2027 and uh, they are uh, located uh, in terms of the costs and times it takes to implement them. The first forecast is in financing. That's what we see in 2022. 75% of local authorities in the world will fund their digital initiatives using public or national budget. 
funding would be not from regional budgets, but from national public budget. This is uh, the key trend, because without the funding necessary, these initiatives won't be able uh, to work. And another forecast is that in 2024, 35% of smart cities will be based on low-code or no-code platforms, which will allow them to introduce digital programs uh, much faster and use new social services as well. By 2025, the largest cities with population of more than 1 million people will increase the expenses by 70% for dynamic uh, da data and platforms in uh, related to uh, transport uh, and uh, by that increasing throughput capacity and thus meet new re needs and um, expectations of users. Another forecast is um, we see that IT and uh, is implemented in all cities, and sometimes it's called the zoo of uh, various digital devices. So by 2025, we expect that 40 percent of cities will not only face cyber attacks, but those will be successful cyber attacks, which will mean that 40% of cities will be uh, will face uh, the threat of such cyber attacks. And in the eighth forecast, we say that by 2026, 30% of cities in the world will create digital accounts for their citizens, and that's what we already see in Kazakhstan. Thanks to the uh, public initiatives, we see that perhaps next year we will have a uh, an account for every citizen that can be used in cities, and uh, using their profiles, they will be able to have an access to all the services. And by 2026, 50 percent of middle cities will use uh, digital twins and in our session we will talk in more detail about digital twins so this is the trend that speaks uh, about the fact that not only big cities but medium cities are also involved in this work and are successful and the last forecast is saying that by 2027 75 percent of cities will uh, critically change the management and culture of data to support the exponential growth of uh, analytics and information systems. And 75% of cities uh, will dramatically change the approach to managing data. And by learning uh, about smart cities within our discussion today, I try to choose those uh, forecasts that will be covered by our speakers during the discussions. And allow me to move to our panel discussion, and I'd like to give the first floor to Madam Kuralai Akatov from the Affiliated Center of the Fourth Industrial Revolution of AFC Technical Hub, so that she can speak about the center and how they use this global information practice uh, to develop smart cities in Kazakhstan. And Ms. Uh, Madam Akatova, the floor is yours. And distinguished colleagues, I'd like to thank for giving me this opportunity to speak today on this platform. And I'd like to talk about the center of fourth industrial revolution of the 
uh, World Economic Forum. It is the innovative global platform that unites pu public institutions, business, uh, civil society, and the key uh, task is to introduce and develop new technologies with uh, launching pilot projects that for which we will receive recommendations and uh, regarding uh, the policies, the technologies. The, uh, the government, the government all and the IFC, uh, the uh, International Financial Center introduce the ecosystem for introducing new technologies with favorable conditions and uh, it will give an impetus for the development of the Republic of Kazakhstan and the Central Asia. I'd like to talk more about the center. On the slide, you can see the main the main goal of our center's creation. It was launched in July this year and started its work in September of this year within the uh, affiliated center in the world. We have another fourteen centers in such countries as the US, uh, the Russian Federation, Switzerland, India, Japan, and today uh, one of the representatives of such center from Japan will speak about initiatives that are being introduced in Japan within smart cities. And um, I'd like to also speak about the fact that the center um, authorizes and gives the possibility for introducing innovative ecosystem in Kazakhstan that will uh, affect the international policies, not only in terms of the fact that we can attract international experts cases and men benchmarks that were introduced in the world, but also uh, the cases that were successfully implemented within smart city programs in Almaty and Nur Sultan. And we will be also able to exchange data uh, on some uh, cases, technologies, and so on. Sencha also allows to build partnerships with uh, other centers that are acting in the world. And we have our priorities such as AI, Internet of Things, uh, and digital assets, data policy, and etc. On the next slide, you can see the main advantages and opportunities that Center provides. This is uh, the access to the unique database of the affiliated Center, and the access of for um, information on new technologies in the world and uh, in such areas uh, as blockchain, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, data analytics, big data, and within uh, the cooperation um, with the center, as I have already noted, uh, it is possible to cooperate with international experts and attract new interesting projects. At the same time, I'd like to add that uh, within the cooperation, not only experts can be attracted, but uh, also uh, the work with investors can be facilitated and new technologies can be introduced. On the next slide, uh, you can learn uh, about the advantages of our center. And I'd like to add that starting from September of this year, a number of roundtables took place um, with participation of international experts, 
uh, who spoke about those initiatives and projects that are being implemented in different countries, strategies that are being developed, and also they talked about the um, protocols and norms uh, that are being implemented and currently jointly with the Japanese Center the strategy for artificial intelligence is being developed and uh, we also participate in this work and I'd like to add that currently we have signed agreements with a number of organizations in Kazakhstan within which we will implement the projects and I'd like to say that we are open for cooperation and we invite all those who are interested in cooperation to work with us and it, you can see my contacts on the screen. Thank you for your attention. Kuralai, thank you very much for presentation. If you allow me, I have a brief question. Uh, today in the cities of Kazakhstan, is there a possibility to use your center to shape new smart cities in the Republic? Thank you very much for your question. This is a very good question. And within uh, the affiliated network, we have an opportunity to study cases on introduction of new technologies such as IoT. On uh, the case, for example, of Brazil, we have uh, studied what stages uh, are uh, what stages uh, are present and how the technologies can be introduced. So we are uh, open. We are uh, ready to share this information uh, with the scientific community with cities, uh, so that they can avoid those mistakes that were made already and can um, efficiently introduce new technologies. Thank you very much once again for your presentation. I agree with you 100% and there are many cities uh, who are, who, uh, uh, the cities that faced um, a number of uh, challenges and mistakes and there is uh, no reason that other cities should um, stumble on the same uh, mistakes. And I believe that the fact that you are sharing uh, experience uh, is very advantageous. And I would like to urge all cities to use advantages of your center. Once again, thank you for your presentation. Now allow me to give the next floor to Madam Alice Charles, Head of Urban Infrastructure and Services of the World Economic Forum and the center of the Fourth Industrial Revolution was uh, established jointly with um, Madam Charles uh, and she will talk about uh, urban planning, new technology. She has more than 20 years of experience in public and private sector in uh, urban urban planning, real estate, urban development, construction, infrastructure, environment, climate change, and public policy. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to see everyone uh, virtually, albeit, uh, here today. So um, I'm going to give you a very brief presentation that's going to focus on the future of cities, but also the role of enabling technology in that future. So first of all, I'm going to turn to what has happened during the pandemic and how is that influencing our cities? So first of all, we've seen huge behavioral shifts. Um, so we have seen, for example, this requirement for more space. We've seen a shift towards remote work. We've seen a shift towards e-commerce. Um, and we've seen much less business travel. But also we have seen a huge affordability challenge in that a lot of people have lost their jobs, so there's a greater need for affordable housing, for example. But also we've seen a huge depletion of city revenues, um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But also we've seen a very big focus on health and well-being in the built environment. And we have seen a greater uptake of technology, particularly in the real estate sector, which didn't use a lot of, of prop tech technology in the past. 
But we have seen an even greater focus than ever on decarbonisation, and that's particularly in terms of net zero buildings, walking, cycling, public transport, sustainable mobility, circularity, um, and we have seen a new meaning being brought to the term resilience. It's no longer just thought about in terms of climate resilience, but it's thought about much more broadly in terms of resilience to financial shocks, resilience to health crisis, et cetera. Um, and I guess there is a belief that cities want to change things, they want to build back better. But that is against a backdrop of a financial crisis, both within city budgets, but also within national government budgets, which you know creates a degree of difficulty in realizing this vision. In terms of what cities want, one of the um, ideas that has the most backing ac across the world is this idea of the 15-minute city, which was put forward by Paris. Например, мы можем рассмотреть примеры, например, города Париж, где был реализован проект «Город 15 минут», и они делают все, чтобы в 15-минутной доступности было все необходимое для человека. Это также новый концепт, например, в городе Мельбурн. Мы видим, что есть идея we live, that we will have, for example, walkable neighborhoods, safe streets, public transport, local employment, local shopping facilities, health facilities, school facilities, parks, green streets, community gardens, and sports facilities. But also that we would have a diversity and mix of housing types, enabled, uh, enabling people to age in place, um, but also having more affordable options and safe streets. And this is a model that's getting a lot of attention in cities around the world. But equally, in terms of thinking about neighborhoods, we also need to think about our city centers and what are the future of our city centers in a post-pandemic world. Um, many of the mayors around the world are part of C40, which is a major mayoral network. There's 97 major cities around the world that are part of it. And they are focused on a green and just recovery. And what they've all agreed to across those 97 cities is a set of nine principles that they would adhere to in terms of their future vision for their cities. And it's very much that we won't have a business as usual model, that science uh, will be adhered to. We will seek to have excellence in public services. We will seek to have equity um, in terms of the, the services that are provided. And um, also that the recovery will be just, it will be resilient. And we will leverage enabling green technology, but also they want all arms of government on, on a green and just recovery for cities, as well as international institutions. And equally, the EU has their own program, which is seeking to have 100 climate neutral and smart cities by 2030. And when they talk about smart cities, they're talking about enabling technology to realize this carbon neutrality goal. And also, more than a thousand cities at COP26 signed up to the race to zero, committing that they will have their emissions um, by 2030, and they will be net zero by 2050. So there's a huge momentum around embracing the climate uh, agenda. So what is the role of technology? First of all, this work I'm going to draw upon is work um, of the World Economic Forum Global Future Council on Cities of Tomorrow, which is co-chaired by Mamouna Sharif, uh, Executive Director of UN Habitat, and Carlo Ratti from MIT. And it includes a variety of leaders of cities and um, those who lead the city's division of businesses and um, major businesses around the world like MasterCard or HSBC and um, also wider civil society and academia and they are looking at you know what do we need what type of enabling technology and what capabilities do we need in cities to drive a green and just recovery and first of all they've looked at what are the unique capabilities provided by digital technology digital technology can enable us to inform so we can gather information, we can process it, we can visualize it, and we can inform citizens. It enables us to engage. So it's a communication method with citizens. It also enables us to simulate, so to test solutions. It enables us to replace, replace physical with digital. It enables us to uh, intensify, so access to physical in infrastructure amongst users. And it enables us to streamline. So cities nowadays are very much focused when they, they talk about using enabling technology on an outcomes-based approach. And why is this?
they made many mistakes in the last two decades in relation to smart cities. Primarily, they focused on widgets and gadgets in the past, rather than what their citizens needed or what the city administration needed. So now that focus has switched and they're switching to an outcomes-based model. So what is it that citizens require? What is it that the, the administration requires and seeking to solve for that? And in that regard, data-driven participatory planning and human-centric design has a major role to play. So what we are seeing is that there's enhanced, they're enhancing data collection at the metropolitan scale. We are seeing promoting co-creation and co-design of city spaces, so working with multi-stakeholders to, to ensure the solutions that they're developing meet the needs of all. We are seeing solution-oriented or design, which is focused on inclusion and accessibility, future-proofing in design, and safeguarding citizens' needs in terms of protecting for cybersecurity and privacy very much coming to the fore. But also we are seeing an agile approach to plan, design, and implementation. So, you know, we are seeing a design phase, uh, sorry, a plan phase, a design phase, a pilot phase, and then checking success, and there's an ability to either iterate, or if they don't believe that a project is going to be successful, to stop it, fail fast, learn fast, and try other solutions. But where solutions are successful, they're seeking to scale fast. We're also city, seeing cities recognize the strategic role of data, um, and they're using data to make decisions. So data-driven decision-making is very much front and center in our cities around the world. And as a result, we're seeing a much greater uh, usage of management dashboards and digital twins, particularly to inform planning processes, for example. Um, but also we are seeing that cities are moving from a much more reactive role to a proactive role. So in analyzing data, for example, they're able to determine how they can better offer infrastructure and services to their citizens. One example is a city that we work with has leveraged their data analysis to realize that they could actually offer um, school places to children in a much more effective way. So they analyzed the data they had on all of their citizens, they seen who was likely to have a child of school going age, and they were able to send those parents an SMS with a proposal on the school that their child should go to, which was basically the nearest school to where they live. So they were able to offer a service in a much more effective way um, for citizens. But also we're seeing a lot of analysis in the area of health as well. Um, so I guess in terms of being a leader in digital, cities need the leadership governance and finance to transform. And in terms of leadership organization and digital skills, what they really need is leadership within the C-suite, if you like. So mayoral leadership, you need a CTO or a CIO within your city. You need to develop and align digital strategy. You need your own flavor. And I think this is really important. A lot of cities think that th what they should do is just replicate what others are doing, but every city has its own unique context. So it's critically important that you um, avail of solutions that are worthy of adoption within your unique context. But also cities need to focus on digital skills. That is across all levels of the city administration, but also amongst their citizens. You cannot be a smart city if you don't have digital literate uh, members of your staff within the city administration, but also citizens. Cities also need to think about governance and you know, the role of, of, of how governance can change as a result of technological interventions. So digital solutions are tools to put citizens back at the center of the city. They, you, know, you can join forces across all levels of government using enabling technology you can better measure and monitor the outcomes of digital technology. Um, but also to implement these technological solutions, you need financing and partnerships. And what we found is one of the more popular models at the moment, particularly for enabling technology, is an outcome-based financing model. So often where the technology provider will provide the infrastructure and the uh, revenue, for example, will be shared between technology provider and the city. Um, we also are seeing consumption-based models and as a service models uh, becoming commonplace within cities in terms of implementing technological solutions. 
we also do need exemplary partnership approaches within cities, and that's common platform approaches, sector-specific approaches, and indeed strategic partnerships. And many of the cities that are best at, at leveraging enabling technology have built up strategic partnerships. So we surveyed cities across the world and we asked them what were the most important digital infrastructure um, and, and capabilities within cities. And in terms of key digital infrastructures, they highlighted it most important for them to have connectivity and computing, to have digital services, to have data and analytics, and to have accessibility for all citizens, so ensure citizens are literate. In terms of key digital capabilities and governance structures, the cities told us that they, they need um, strategy and collaboration, so they need digital leadership, they need a digital strategy, they need digital skills and innovation, they need regulation and they need partnerships to be successful in leveraging technology. So in terms of, with my final slide, what are the recommendations for the middle city to utilize digital infrastructure in the city of tomorrow? First of all, they need to have the right internal governance capabilities and processes. Secondly, they need to engage the relevant stakeholders. And thirdly, they need to focus on delivery excellence. So if I unpack that a little bit, within internal governance capabilities and processes, they need to establish their digital le leadership. They need to find their own flavor. They need to do the inside job in terms of having uh, it's, it's employees who are uh, digitally literate, but also citizens, and they need to explore the strategic role of data. In terms of external stakeholders, it's important to engage uh, stakeholders in terms of co-creating, and that's all stakeholders. So you're, you're ensuring that you're solving for the right problem, but it's also important to establish partnerships for excess, a success with external stakeholders. In terms of delivery excellence, it starts with needs and use cases, focusing on the digital solutions to address the unmet needs, designing for privacy, security, and equity, deploying agile processes, and actively managing change. So I'm going to stop there. I guess the main message of what I'm saying is technology is an enabler and very much should be viewed by that, as that, sorry, by any city that's seeking to become smart, if you like. Thank you very much. Alice, um, uh, I, I had an internet connectivity uh, problem there for a second. Uh, thank you so much for uh, an excellent uh, presentation. But if I may uh, ask uh, a very quick question. Uh, you uh, talked about data-driven approach. You talked uh, about the leadership necessary, the skills, the financing, and the partnerships uh, you know, to enable uh, smart cities. Um, but uh, if, if you can uh, quickly touch on a subject of policy and legislation consideration, because uh, that, that's what we see that often holds the uh, transformation of cities. So um, you were breaking up a little bit, but I think your question related to policy, if I'm correct. Yes, uh, policy yeah. and legislation uh, considerations, uh, because they often hold uh, the fast deployment of all these uh, technologies in the cities. Uh, what, what do you think should be uh, done first and foremost? Because the cities there are often focusing on, you know, uh, at best at the regional level, but, uh, you know, the policy and legislation is uh, at national uh, level, and we see that uh, uh, as something that is stalling uh, the progress. So I think it's a really important point because um, for anything you want to do in a city, you need to have alignment between national government, regional government and city government policy. Um, and I think this is often one of the big issues that cities encounter in terms of uh, seeking to attract investment is where there is a lack of alignment between national, regional and city government policy, it obviously poses a risk and an investor doesn't necessarily want to invest in, in that city. So uh, you do need 
national government to, to set the scene, but you need city government to actually set out the vision. And I think it's critically important that you have at a city level, a digital strategy for your city. And that means understanding your citizens' needs, understanding your city administration needs, seeking to break down the silos within the city authority and putting forward a strategy that will help to deliver the digital needs of all departments and to meet the needs of citizens. Okay, yeah, uh, I mean, that makes uh, perfect sense. And I guess we can have a, a separate session uh, on, on this subject. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Alice. Uh, in your presentation, uh, you've touched uh, on a subject of a digital twin. Uh, and uh, we have uh, a very unique case in Kazakhstan, uh, in the city of Nur Sultan, um, where uh, the city is moving uh, to the next stage. So this is not just a digital twin, it's the virtual uh, you know, city. Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, pass the microphone to Ms. Patagos Kasebek. Я давайте на русский перейду уже руководителю управления цифровизации города Нур-Султан, госпожа uh, now I give the floor to Batakos Kasabek, the head of the Digitalization and Public Services Department of Nur Sultan. Please brief us on a project that was launched uh, recently and uh, has already showed success. What the next stage of this project will include? Thank you so much, Andrei. Good afternoon. Greetings to everyone, to the viewers, distinguished participants. Now, I'd like to brief you on a project that we are launching in our capital and found continuation in the virtual universe that is very relevant nowadays. Technologies are always developing, and this is why we decided to develop further. Digital Twin was the, the digital twin program we decided to implement it to analyze the infrastructure to understand what is happening in the city uh, how fast the buildings are being uh, established and how to develop the infrastructure to analyze big data, the centers, etc. And this is how uh, we establish digital twin in our capital. What is it? First of all, this is digitizing the city into D, 3D format, the land slots, engineer uh, networks, transport infrastructure, architecture, cooperation with the nature, Thanks to it, we understand how the city is growing, where the trees are being planted. It's very windy in capitals, so to manage the city, to monitor and plan it uh, properly, we developed digital twin. The city uses this twin actively after we, uh, after the city department uh, approves this twin, we will be using it. Our citizens, our population will see it and will understand how the city is growing. They will see where they can buy a land slot and how the cities will be developed in future thanks to it business businesses understand how the city is growing and where the kindergarten for example is needed or a school now we're growing further and you can see a prototype pro prototype of uh, virtual augmented reality 
where we can conduct meetings. If, for example, if people have remote access, they can use VR headset or without VR headset, connect. They what advantages does it give us to us? A fully augmented reality opportunity to conduct events, meetings, a deep le learning. For example, when the learning processes are being conducted with technologies, so the person could be immersed in this augmented reality and receive knowledge. Also, it can be used in marketing sphere. For example, when you plan the layout of your flat houses, you can plan it virtually and introduce it to this virtual reality and see how your building will be established. Also, you can see how the building process is being carried out. For example, now you see the landslide of Nazarbayev University. You can move from one room to another. In a current pandemic, realities, when we are far apart from each other, you can roam around the building remotely, move from one cabinet to another. Everyone has this opportunity. Everyone who can buy a VR, VR headset or through a specialized software. You, you could also speak with people virtually using your avatar. Currently, our avatar are in the form of arrows. And with the name, in the future, we will be introducing uh, full-fledged avatars that will be engaging with each other. You can play different games such as Sims. And it will be just the same as in the game. You will be able to be in a building remotely. And thanks to it, you will also be see buildings in the city, architecture of the city without leaving your office or your home. We have cameras. They are very useful when you have to control uh, building objects and etc. Thanks to virtual reality, you can move around it without leaving your office or your home. It's very useful for monitoring. A certain object on the same principle. You can visit smart objects, museum, cultural events. Since this is a digital twin, you can visit it too and see how the build, how a city is being built and how it's growing. Besides it, Besides presentation and the possibility to carry out education, I'd like to highlight that virtual reality is accessible for people with disabilities. It's very important and we think that when the person can leave their home, it would be very useful to them. It will be a breakthrough for these people because they will be able to stroll and to work remotely. Also, we can to provide st uh, public services. 
remotely. We are constantly growing and developing on the same principle in our digital twin. Our monopolists are working and now we receive great reviews for the digital twin prototype. And next year we will be we will finish the development of this project and we will be showcasing the final prod product with avatars. Thank you so much. This is very unique, very exciting. The opportunity to, to stroll in a virtual city. A question. This year, the project for Meta Universe uh, was launched and Nur Sultan City could also participate in this project and all the citizens will be able to visit and uh, to walk in the snowy capital. This is all based on digital twin that uh, Nur Sultan is developing uh, rapidly. Can you say what part of the city were digit digitized and are available as a digital twin? Digital twin. The city was digitized fully. The digital twin is completely is complete. Currently, it's being reviewed by state systems, and after the review and approval, it will be available for use. We have 80 layers in Digital Twin for the land, for the architecture. You have a chance to see how the population is increasing and to monitor trends. It's necessary for businesses because we are responsible for digitization of capital. We are cooperating with many companies that are very interested to work with us uh, in the sphere of big data and, and we are cooperating with them and we plan to provide them data that related to general data without information on population that will not expose the personal data for our citizens. Our project already demonstrate, demonstrates advantages because the monopolists in the sphere of water, energy, we already see opportunities and the load in this sphere and we already see how many infrastructure networks we have to build to ensure uh, the balance in, uh, in energy consumption and heating the work that we've done already shows benefits and our citizens will see this benefits next year. The citizens also have opportunity to uh, pitch their proposals and recommendations. We have a platform uh, that allows to every citizens to uh, to propose their initiative and it allows a voting among citizens and the four projects we have launched and these projects were initiated by citizens amazing i'm happy to see this focus on a citizens the paradigm is changing this is what our analysts uh, are talking about all the processes in cities i start to focus on a citizen and this is how it should be because cities 
exist for a comfort of citizens. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Kasabek. Before moving to our next speaker, I'd like to the World Economic Forum to pay attention to experience of Nur Sultan, in particular the Digital Twin Project, because our Congress, G Global, is dedicated on raising this issue globally, and the the practice that we already have in Kazakhstan, Nur Sultan, should be uh, studied and researched so other cities could replicate our experience. And continuing the globalization topic, I'd like to give the floor to our next speaker, Yuta Hirayama, head of the projects of World Economic Forum, head of the uh, Fourth Industrial Revolution Center. Since March 2019, Mr. Yuta works in this sphere. And the topic of uh, smart cities is being raised with an alliance. Mr. Yuta will talk about what role the alliance okay. uh, Thank you very much for introducing me. Um, let me start uh, my presentation. Okay. So on So on so my name is Yuta Hirayama. I'm in charge of the Smart City project at the CFR Japan. And my main role is the manager of the G20 Global Smart City Alliance Japanese community. So um, today I would like to explain about my you know uh, project and also um, some Japanese smart city project. So perhaps uh, you don't know much about the activities of the G20 Global Smart City Alliance. So and firstly, I would like to explain this. And this initiative was proposed in 2019 uh, when Japan was in the G20 presidency. Uh, it was clearly uh, noted, uh, clearly stated in the communique at that time. And fortunately, uh, we were appointed as a secret secretariat. So that's why, you know, we, we could start this project uh, from the 2019. And we have been active for more than two years. And last year, we announced a pioneer program with uh, 36 cities corporate toward implementing uh, five pillars and model policies. So now, you know, Japan has a Japanese community, uh, the 26 cities joining this community. And India is also, uh, C4 India Center is managing 10 cities, Indian cities. And Latin America is also developing the city community. So like this, now we are expanding to the city community in all over the world. And today I'm from Japan. So I'd like to explain some you know, Japanese smart city project. And unfortunately, uh, the Japan is not very digital. Um, in a recent ranking by the Influential IMD World uh, Competitiveness Center, Japan uh, ranks just 27th in the world in digital competitiveness. I give you one another example. So do you know Japan's uh, credit card usage rate? Maybe you imagine 40 or 50 or 60 percent, but the answer is just a 16 percent, so one six percent. So this is very low, right? Um, this means, you know, more than 80% of the people love to use cash. Even the credit card can use everywhere. So and like this, you know, Japan is very, very slow to transform the digital, you know, things. So that, that is a kind of the uh, big problem here. And of course, you know, Japan government want to change this. And the one of the solution is the super city projects. So this is the flagship project in smart city field in Japan. And uh, the super city law has passed in 2020 and aims to improve the collaboration between the public and private, uh, the digital transformation of cities. And also super city, sorry, the super city is a type of special economic zone. 
and the selected area will be able to work on regulatory reform and at the same time as promoting smart project. I think this is not so difficult to understand. I mean, for example, if you want to uh, drive an autonomous vehicle in the city, or if you want to fly the flying car in the city, of course, you know, it is not accepted um, because of the regulation. However, super city is the special economic zone. So if, you know, the local government want to uh, try such kind of a project, it's more easier to deregulate those rules. So that, that is the basic concept of the super city. So now, you know, the more than 30 cities are applying to the super city, but the government has not uh, selected yet. But I think in this one or two months, maybe they will choose. So um, I'm very looking forward to seeing this you know, situation. So, okay, but when we develop such kind of smart city, what is uh, important? So my, my answer or, you know, the answer what we are thinking is um, the technology governance. Um, I mean, you know, implementing the five, you know, uh, pillars, uh, what we are uh, suggesting in the, for the ethical smart cities. And we, we developed the, some, you know, model policies before and such kind of the policies implementing the city is very important for developing smart city. Um, last year, uh, Smart City Guidebook, which was published by the cabinet office, uh, when we read this, um, our, you know, five pillars is on this book. So this means um, many local governments uh, refer to, to the, our five, you know, principal. So we can say the five pillars as a basic concept in the Smart City Guidebook. So, and, you know, this means like, you know, our model policy or our policy is uh, was used as a national policy. So I think this is kind of the good outcome of the Shifaru Japan and Japan government collaboration. And the second thing is the privacy impact assessment policy. So we developed this policy last year and privacy impact assessment is common in the Western culture. However, in the Asia or Asia or you know Africa or such kind of the area, it's not so common. And in Japan, it's also so. Uh, when the twenty six, you know, our Japanese community uh, cities, no cities is you know uh, deploy such kind of the uh, PIA policy. However, so last year, uh, the government, uh, you know, uh, referred to our model policy in the working group of the government conference, and then many, you know. Uh, cities are referring to our model policy. So now I'm supporting some cities to implement uh, our model policy. But I think this is also a good collaboration to the uh, government. So when Shifaru Japan is strongly supporting to the, uh, you know, government uh, to through the healthy, you know, smart city market. Okay, um, lastly, I think, you know, my time is seven minutes, so on. I want to keep my, you know, <laughs> time, so on. I, I will finish this, you know, slide. But uh, so last month, um, our, you know, G20 Global Smart, Smart Cities Alliance team got a uh, uh, governance and economy award in, at the Smart City Expo. So I, I believe, you know, this activity is going to be expanding. So, you know, if the Kazakhstan or, you know, New Sultan city uh, want to, you know, uh, join our community, I'm very happy that. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Rita, for uh, an insightful uh, presentation. Uh, a quick uh, question. Um, from what I understood, uh, the Super City Initiative uh, is a creation uh, of a special uh, zone that would allow uh, the city to experiment uh, without uh, the borders of the national legislation. Am I correct? Um, yes. However, you know, of course, you know, uh, once, you know, they selected as a super city, the local government can communicate with the national government to deregulate such kind of the rules if they deploy smart technology to the city. So it's not like, you know, fully 100% you know freedom in the city but of course you know but the opportunity is more higher than the 
uh, usual in a city. So that, that is the situation. Okay, so can we call it uh, a regulatory sandbox in a way? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, th th this would uh, be of uh, big interest to the uh, cities in uh, Kazakhstan uh, because uh, the cities in Kazakhstan are uh, looking at the opportunity of having a regulatory uh, sandbox uh, regime, right. especially from uh, how Japan went about uh, with the national uh, level government to allow for these uh, regulatory uh, sandboxes. Uh, so uh, thank you so much for your uh, insightful presentation. Uh, and I'm sure the cities uh, from Kazakhstan would uh, reach out to learn from your uh, experiences. Um, one, one, one of such uh, cities would be uh, Almaty. Uh, Тема uh, вот такой регулятор, регуляторной песочницы для Алматы uh, очень uh, интересна. Uh, очень много проектов делается uh, в Алматы в области uh, умных uh, городов. И один из таких uh, проектов – это единое хранилище данных города Алматы. Uh, проект uh, начался со всех. So one of the project is a single data storage in Almaty city. Arigul Darmenov will talk about the results of this project. The head of the digitalization department of Almaty city, Ayum, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, the participants of the session. Thank you so much for interesting presentations. Let me brief you on the results of this project to in introduce you to these projects and on the outcomes of this project. Single data storage of Almaty in accordance with the digitalization strategy uh, 2025 is one of the infrastructure projects. City implements many pro the majority of the projects on the service model, but uh, several cities are, are under the leadership of the city. When we were developing this project, we decided that since the data belongs not only to the state bodies, but also the commercial companies, and we talk about the smartest, we talk about the IT world and centers that city has to learn how to work with, we decided to create an IT, open IT platform that allows to exchange information between state departments, between commercial businesses, uh, uh, and expert in civic communities. Thank you so much, Alice, for the presentation that touched upon this agility of the cities when we talk about the local administrations. If we talk about the case studies and when we can to form measurables, measurable KPIs, all these projects have a single idea, goal to integrate the economic situation in the city and to allow the adaptability to the changing situation. All the cities face the problem of pandemics and the lack of data issue, and this issue was uh, outlined in the UN report on the uh, sustainable development goals. And UN report noted that this issue has a global nature and it should be resolved on the level of local administrations. And we talk about um, data management. This is a very important aspect. What are we doing now? As Andre mentioned, the project was launched recently. This year, we started a uh, to to operate it in practice. Our concept of open IT platform. found allies in the face of Singapore company and Singapore approach of three 
360-degree view. We use clusters to gather and storage data for business and social protection, and we would like to create to form a full review of the needs of citizens and needs of stakeholders because companies and organizations apply to us on a voluntary basis and we exchange anonymized data that they lack in their systems and would like to implement the model that will allow to us to provide to citizens proactive services and the project on a single data storage in Almaty will be developed in several stages in several clusters North Sultan City just showcased its digital twin and this is uh, from the point of view of a landlord cluster And the main issue, why we need to gather and integrate data to ensure the data-driven decisions on this platform when the managers can analyze data uh, not only on the basis of their experience and intuition, but uh, also on the basis of data. It allows to understand where the modernization can be launched. We also want to simplify the data exchange between business processes when we can move from the uh, paper document circulation and to teach state bodies and commercial companies to use digital data. When we talk about the listening state concept, we need to provide data to society and to city. The community that generates this data and to that end we create IT sandbox where the IT data can be accessed by anybody. On December 9th we already launched IT sandbox of Almaty City and the first three types of visualized data that we uh, updated, uploaded. We uploaded the map of the population uh, intensity that shows the population and the breakdown of marketing. Uh, for businesses who would like to establish a robototechnic um, a school academy or, for example, a kindergarten, they can see this data. And if the companies need data sets, we are also open for a cooperation. And again, as Alice mentioned, the community engagement is very important too, to involve the citizens in this process. We say that we are ready to provide you data sets that you need for your activities, but in exchange, we are asking to avoid to name the cases that are necessary to resolve the socio-economic problems of the city. Uh, and we say, let's resolve them together. And also project we launched with the suppliers of utility services of Lamati City. It allowed us to, to make significant prog progress that utility service couldn't achieve uh, many years. Our team uh, included representatives from Singapore too and from Almaty. Unfortunately, we couldn't launch this project free of free of charge due to the lockdown. This project updated data for utility service workers by 15 percent, depending on the utility service. This is why we started this project, to to ensure that the income from utility services can be applied in modernization process for the sake of citizens. Why are we doing this? 
when we're talking about cooperation between state and citizens, IT platforms allow us to realization of the concept data for citizens. We gathered the data from various spheres, from from transport, etc. This data has 23 categories. The network that goes through entire social cluster, and it allows to autom automate the provision of social preferences to uh, certain population groups. The company that is engaged in the waste management provides preferences to veterans of uh, Second World War, but not everyone can leave their houses and visit the office of the company. And this is unfair to citizens uh, who have done so much for our country. And so this IT platform allows to provide this proactive services to the cities and we are working on this. And how Andre mentioned the main problems are not of a technolo technological nature, but of legal nature. We want citizens to remember that when they allow their personal data, anonymized personal data, uh, to be used by city, this data returns to them in the form of proactive services. Our project was commended there is a competition of uh, academy of academic management lab and our project won award as a best project and that's it thank you for your attention i'm ready to answer your questions i thank you very much if you let me just some questions as a continuation of that questions and uh, so now we are seeing on in our practice uh, exactly the problems of of the regulations exactly regulations of that are uh, preventing such projects what are the uh, problems of uh, legislative regulations of uh, implementation of such projects in Almaty. And the second question is uh, that was talked about already. What are the uh, possibilities to work on these projects and uh, specifically on a legislative basis? Thank you, Andre, for the question. It's a very interesting question and a very problematic one. So for the first, in this pilot project, we understood that there are many definitions who are the citizens of Almaty. Some subjects uh, have uh, different monopolies on this region and uh, they are regulated by the different ministries and they have their own understanding, for example, Maybe is understanding will be some uh, citizens are that registered or temporary registered. So in this connection uh, with the legal uh, differentiations, there are, there are some barriers and the problems that the city in his own level can solve these problems and have um, unified definition according to the administrative codes uh, the person who are living more than 30 days should be should be the users of the services of this city and their children are going to that schools and uh, they can use uh, the service of healthcare so uh, the regulatory 
uh, help will be <coughs> can uh, can show uh, there are solutions on the legislative basis that we are ready to solve them. Thank you, Alina, very much. Uh, we're wishing you success. So this is very important project on the level of Republic. It is necessary to study the experience of Almaty. Thank you very much. I would like to pass to the next speaker. We have uh, touched the questions of interesting things in the beginning of our session. We have Roman Libertinov from the Department of uh, Projects uh, uh, of Kazakh Telecom. He's uh, working with the development of uh, s smart projects in the city of Almaty. So he will talk about uh, his vision and uh, other uh, systems of uh, usage. Please, the floor is yours. First, for the first of all, I would like to thank that I have the uh, opportunity to uh, participate in this meeting, in this uh, event, and I have given the floor to speak. So. We were talking about many things, so we think that no, the national tele telecommunication company is important, and uh, because of the topic is on about the internet, the topic of the presentation is uh, the vision of the development of uh, internet things issues. Today we were talking about the regulatory issues uh, of digital 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 Kazakhstan. In, on 2017, there were a special um, uh, industry zone. Also in 2018, the first definition of Internet of Things was formed, and uh, according to it, we see that it's related to infrastructure operators of communications this is very relevant to us too it is a global tent of involving telecom companies into the development of internet of things we see that everyone has their smartphones and the consumer base that is behind the internet of things is very attractive for uh, telecommunication companies in kazakhstan uh, this under our national project uh, digital breakthrough smart metering is defined in it as a accounting of all energy in consumption and energy that is being uh, uh, put into the grid our colleague briefed us on the uh, forecasts we used as a basis uh, Jason partner forecasts forecast on the development in Kazakhstan until 2024 and we see that despite of the pandemic uh, the increase in internet of things is forecast is being forecasted to grow to grow from 25 percent and the utility block amounts to 45 percent of share telecom companies and the utility service are being showed on this slide and since the middle of this year the project was was uh, showed to the minister also the importance of the project of inter on internet of things is reflected in the model standard of Kazakhstan methodological recommendations show that that model standard has 
89 initiatives, one third of them are the initiatives that are related to Internet of Things. And out of this one third projects, around 11 projects are projects related to utility sphere. And majority of them are initiatives related to the implementation of smart meters. In Kazakhstan, there is a definition uh, was that was introduced five years ago. This is the system that gathers the data from all the meters, energy, gas, electricity, and water meters. All these data are being integrated in one system, and it provides advantages. And as I understand, the number of people that are being built on the basis of the consumption standards the same logic is being implemented to our sub project there is no need to establish different systems for electricity meters for gas meters when the when all the data is being integrated in one systems a lot of benefits can be received in 2019 we launched a pilot project or oh, internet of things solution this very project very interesting project within this project we tested our software. It was reviewed by the president and approved for the scale scaling up of this project. As my colleague mentioned, the key role regarding the legislation basis the main problems that we face are related to legislation and there is also a lack of operators whose functions would be regulated if we talk about the architecture of ASU our vision is following in the breakdown of all initial utility devices who could be digitalized in red the Asua block is being highlighted it has IT apps all the Kazakh participants who could participate in this market are being showed Kazakh Telecom don't have ambitions uh, for all the spheres only for data exchange we proposed candidates candidates for us were operators but our candidacy was not approved they couldn't be involved as operator of this project and the most appropriate is currently a fund of an artificial intelligence under the Nazarbayev fund we will have our national artificial intelligence platform and the most appropriate operator for this project is AI fund and we are waiting for the approval of the government and after receiving approval we'll be developing this project in detail and I will brief about this later so I won't be describing this in detail as well introduction of us where uh, allows us to reduce the consumption of energy resources if we look at the utility service this mainly relates to the consumption block 
and we need to integrate this project with the Yashan Rock program. They support our decision. Also, one of the advantages is that through consolidation of the purchase through ASUA operator, we will decrease the smart metering price and would be able to attract and launch the production of smart meters that is new to Kazakhstan to ensure the purchase through a single operator. The manufacturers of smart meters support the development of this project. And the last slide is related to the regulatory issues too. You see the events that are in the basis of the national project bre technology breakthrough. All these events are related to the introduction of Internet of Things. First event is the introduction of IT sandbox. We already nego conducted negotiations with AFC. They supported us. On the basis of legislation, we will describe in detail the order of introduction of IoT. The Ministry of Digital Introduction and the Profile Ministries also supported us. And since the beginning of 2022, this IT project on Sandbox, we will launch it. The Akimat of Nur Sultan also supported us. And the second and the third event is related to the standards. I'd like to note that this year, Kazakh Telecom financed the development of the first national standard on the basis of the protocol Lorovan. The national project envisages several standards, and in 2022, on this basis, we will we'll introduce new standards on the basis of MBA, UT. In principle, I have finished. Thank you for attention. Rawan, thank you. Thank you very much. According to your opinion, in your opinion, if to um, take one uh, key factor, which is working with UIUT of Kazakhstan, IoT project, we see that. Uh, some works are done already on the ILT project in Kazakhstan. Is there any special key factor that influenced it? Okay, maybe I will repeat. Uh, the last my slide was uh, devoted to regulate, regulatory factors. For example, Kazakh Telecom uh, started with uh, the way to cover the Kazakhstani uh, uh, region. <coughs> there were uh, purchased many uh, equipments, but uh, after the issue of regulatory uh, problems will be d uh, solved, we will decide the further steps <coughs> because uh, we uh, understood the uh, the <coughs> uh, the uh, steps that will be uh, done after the solution. Maybe some other standards there were uh, to be uh, adapted. There are two ways. For example, the legislative on energy uh, say, uh, safety, how it will be adapted. Um, and the second way is the legislative on uh, that were uh, that were discussed with the Maslihat of the city. It will take like three months, maybe uh, at the end of the first uh, uh, three months of the year. Hopefully, we will be uh, decide how to uh, build this uh, the in the construction of the inside the city. 
but there are many many questions that are, should be discussed and uh, solved and we should uh, form uh, several standards on the basis of leg legislatives so and uh, on the basis of recommendations uh, and uh, together with the maslihat because there are many uh, problems that are included on the level of the cities so that's why we need uh, a final solution I understand that it will not be decided on the level of one CC to show how it will work so to change maybe to change uh, the solution is to change the legislative is it right it's uh, also uh, connected with the vulnerable uh, community of the uh, society and uh, maybe on the level of national requirements and uh, uh, laws to s to look at the uh, the like ways to solve the problems and on the basis of some uh, legislative norms thank you norlan i hope that the projects that are uh, you started will be successful and they are very uh, in need not only for the uh, capital city but other cities of the uh, of our country on this at this moment i would like to conclude uh, shortly the our session we have seen the global projects the global approaches uh, and all questions that are connected with the development of technology regulation of the issues some of the examples we have seen we have considered some projects that are connected with kazakhstan and the technologies the questions were raised were in a level of in the global level I, I think that uh, all the speakers together with me uh, managed to find some of the solutions and uh, to find the aims of uh, to be directed to solve and uh, to develop the project on the basis of experience on, uh, to decide uh, several tasks on the international level and the local level i would like to thank all the speakers and the or organizers uh, the sponsors thank you very much Hello and uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the session entitled The Future of the Financial Sector, Digital Innovation and Development on Financial Ecosystem. My name is Mark Cousin. I am the director and the founder of the pre Bretton Woods Committee. And I'm very privileged today to share these very important uh, discussions that would bring together top you know, banks and fintech companies from, from Kazakhstan. Of course, before I introduce our speakers, I wanted to set the stage about clearly the challenges that the global economy is facing and also particularly the financial sector in a post-COVID environment. Indeed, you know, as everyone will, we will discuss after this session, the global economy is facing a divergent economic outlook and we are shifting from a place where we have low growth, low inflation, low interest rate, to a period where we might be going to a period of higher growth, higher interest rates, and higher inflation. Of course, these parameters are very critical for the banking sector and the financial sector all over the world, and of course, for regulators. If I take the example of Kazakhstan and to try to set the stage, 
GDP growth in Kazakhstan reached 3.5%, returning output to its pre-COVID level. Inflation has exceeded around 46% target bank of the National Bank of Kazakhstan and stood at 8.9% in October. Credit growth accelerated to 16% in September and labor market and poverty indicators have remained resilient through the pandemic with unemployment stable at about 5%. The banking system has weathered well the impact of the COVID shock, with bank profitability, liquidity, and capitalization remaining strong. As the recovery continues, the authorities plan to unwind both of the anti-crisis regulatory measures introduced last year by the end of 2021. In this transition, the authorities will need to monitor any new risk, including fast-growing consumer lending which may require targeted macroprudential measures to avoid an excessive debt buildup in the household sector. So the issue that I would like to discuss today with our high-level panelists, first will be what are the major risks that the financial sector might be facing in the medium term, particularly the scaring effect of the crisis of the corporate sector that will reverberate in the financial sector. Do we see here any vulnerability? How to unwind financial sector measures that were used to support the economy, what should be the right sequencing, and what are the potential tools to enhance financial stability. Of course, when you have challenge, you have also opportunities because we are facing a major transformation in the financial sector, not only in Kazakhstan, but all over the world. Our technology is really helping the increase of financial inclusion. We're seeing, of course, the rise of new players jumping, the volume of data is increasing, and our companies can drive the major transformation from cash economy, cash flashing. In order to talk about all these issues, we have an outstanding group of speakers, and let me first introduce them to you, and I will give them the floor for around 10 minutes, and after we will open for questions and answers, and I will be very happy to moderate that. Our first speaker will be Mr. Oleg Somlyakov, the first deputy chairman of the Agency for Regulation and Development of the Financial Market of the Republic of Kazakhstan. Oleg, welcome. It's a great pleasure to see you again. I might recall maybe that we met in Peru in 2015 uh, during the IMF World Bank meeting. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us. We'll be followed by uh, Alia Diakanbaeva. I'm sorry for the pronunciation. She's the first deputy chairperson of the Managing Board. Of Forte Bank. Alia, welcome also. Liazat Ibrahimov, the chairman of the board of Forte Bank. Aibek Kaipe, the chairman of the management board of Jusan Bank. And last but not least, Mikhail Lomtadze, the head and the co founder of Caspi, the major fintech company from Central Asia that is really creating a major you know, driver for innovation. In, in Central Asia and all, all over the world, and we can even learn from him, you know, for countries in Europe and other countries in the world. Before I give the floor to all our high-level speakers, let me also on behalf of our organizer of G Global, thank our, all our sponsors here and our lead sponsor, Caspi. Thank you very much, Forte Bank, Altin Bank, Odbasi Bank, UST, Camelorgos, Titanium, and Management Plan Joint Stock Company for their support for making you know, this event you know, a reality. And thank on behalf of the G Global and our colleagues, really your you support for making this event possible. Let's go now to our you know, set of issues that I have uh, out at the beginning and give the floor to Oleg. Oleg, please, over to you. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, greetings to every participants at the G Global Forum. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss relevant issues and possible challenges that we face in financial sector. And I'd like to congratulate all the colleagues for the upcoming 30th anniversary of independence of Kazakhstan. I'd like to highlight that the, this year was significant in the development of financial sector, increase of capitalization and the liquidity uh, prevented the financial crisis. The pandemic crisis also 
allowed us to ensure the sustainability of banking sector. The resolution of uh, previous challenges is the reason for our further success. Thanking to the clearance of banking sector, since 2017 has decreased uh, four times. If we talk about the loans, it amounted to 4% as compared to the minimal levels of the recent 15 years. The main factor of the 2019 yeah. And the results of uh, of the capitalization, uh, we have uh, sh uh, seen the, capi the capital of banks, which is uh, increased uh, for 25 percent. Uh, the main uh, achievement was tr transformation of the system and automatization of uh, of the clients uh, that have chance to pay. Also, and all these functions and mandates are regulated and supervised. They are monitored and reviewed uh, from the point of view of efficiency of corporate governance. We developed a concept of the uh, oversight testing we launched it since 2022 we also besides it uh, since 2023 we plan to launch uh, the market capital depending on the profile of the bank all the discussions and the reviews of the regulators uh, they will be reflected individually In the majority developed country, developing countries, the financial model of Kazakhstan is bank-centric, with the mobilization of the financial resources and the challenges related to the increased competitiveness. New technologies define new stage of development uh, that is focused on increase of inclusivity and accessibility of financial services. Other sectors also increase their contribution in meeting the needs of population. We see that the insurance in insurance sphere, there is a uh, big potential. Since last year, uh, the insurance capacities of companies uh, have increased. In the accumulation insurance, since this year, we introduced projects for long-term insurance products. We also provision, uh, ensure the provision of insurance services uh, in online format to ensure the transparency of all the pro of the entire process of receiving the insurance. We also plan to increase the ac accessibility of insurance services. The main trend in the fund market through to stimulate the immunity including the bonds for a private deployment we for establish the normative regulatory base for the issuance of green bonds and to increase the transparency, transparency and trust to the market and introduce the principles of CG in the activity of financial organizations. The main, the key task that covers all the spheres of financial sector is particularly 
as of the last information, Kazakhstan 16.5 citizens use the services of bank as compared to 2018. Only 14% of population used uh, these services. So this signals the increase the increase of the accessibility of financial services. This relates to the active transformation of financial sector to digital format and in establishment of financial platforms that consolidate the services. There are new actors in the financial sectors who to improve the financial services provide these services online. The progressive growth requires us taking measures to prevent the risks and mitigate the consequences of the threats. I, I'd like to highlight the risks that we have to pay attention to. First of all, those are risks of financial stability, involvement of a big number of consumers, and increased risks of banks The, the activity of some banks is not regulated. We need to streamline the processes. Well, secondly, the risks of regulatory issues. FinTech companies, due to the lack of licensing and monitoring, and also decreased competitiveness in the financial sector, involvement of third-party suppliers and using unfair practices. And thirdly, cyber security risks, a chance to use, to violate the personal data of the consumers. Taking into, into account the international practice, we plan to create a climate that will stimulate the development of uh, technologies and ecosystems and will attract the partners. We cooperate with national bank and government on this issue. Uh, we plan to involve all the regulators to ensure the uh, privacy of personal data to ensure the fair competitiveness on the sector, we introduced, we ensured the equal use of data to ensure the protection of the uh, consumer rights. We introduced regulations on the cybersecurity. The key task is to ensure the regulatory and financial accountability. In this context, in the future, to regulate the development, we will be focusing on the types of organizations and we will regulate their types of activities which will allow us to ensure the protection of consumer rights. The introduction of these activities will contribute to the development of the financial sector overall. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, um, for your presentation, particularly the feeling that you are really embracing, you know, digital innovation. Of course, we need rule of the game. We need good regulation. We need to make sure that we have uh, 
privacy, consumer rights. We need to make sure that the same playing field happening for, for the financial sector. We will get back to you about, about all of these questions uh, after all the presentation. I will have maybe one or two questions for you at the end of the, of the panel. Let's now move on to our second speaker, Alia Diakanbaeva, the first deputy chairperson of the management board of Forte Bank. Alia, thank you and welcome to, to the session. Over to you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We have a brief presentation. Uh, give me a second. Uh, do you see my slides? Yes, we do. We see very clearly. Excellent. On the future of financial sector and to the global regulatory landscape, uh, I would like to talk about ESG agenda for the banks. And uh, we see globally increasing um, awareness and need of, um, um, of consolidated actions to, take, to, to be taken to tackle environmental problems and to tackle social risks. Uh, in this small presentation, I want to look at this topic from practical perspective and to discuss why ESG is important for the banking industry and how can we influence it. Well, to start, I wanted to show this um, um, uh, report. Uh, this is the World Economic uh, Forum's Global Risks Report for 2020. And what we can see here that uh, climate change and related environmental issues ranked uh, top five in terms of uh, likelihood. This is the first time in the history of this survey that environment and um, the single category as environment and in climate change um, risks are ranked as top five and took all five spots. What we also see here is how all these strategic risks are interconnected. Uh, climate action failure is very connected with water crisis, with involuntary migration. What we also see is that human-made environmental disasters uh, related with biodiversity loss and flood crisis, governance failures with social instability and technological threats. And so uh, importance of ESG agenda is growing and we see that it is recognized by all banks in, uh, throughout the world. Um, I want to cite here the principles for responsible banking, because I find this very important and very relevant in the discussion of the future of financial sector. Banking is based on the trust our customers and wider society put in us to serve their best interests and to act responsibly. Our success is intrinsically dependent on the long-term prosperity of the society we serve. Only in an inclusive society that uses all natural resources in a sustainable manner can our clients and customers, and in turn, um, our businesses thrive. Uh, as sustainability becomes more important to more uh, stakeholders, we can talk about customers, employees, about suppliers, policy makers, companies that exhibit better ESG performance will have better long-term uh, growth and uh, better prospects. ESG risks include environmental risks, social risks, governance risks. ESG risks can affect the bank directly through, for instance, damage of the bank's property, or indirectly by affecting customers uh, with change of, for instance, in sales, opportunities, production disruption that may lead to the uh, higher loan defaults. Um, it's interesting that uh, according to 
McKinsey estimate up to 15% of the balance sheet of banks in the European Union uh, are at risk in relation with climate change. Uh, these risks include real estate market collapse in low-lying areas, increased risk of major crop failures, and implication for meat and dairy uh, production, and the closures of coal-powered power plants before end of the, their useful life. ESG uh, may, that may also serve as a differentiating factor to attract better talents and clients. And this understanding is also um, gaining momentum. So uh, how can we influence? As financial intermediaries, banks may contribute to the realignment of capital flows towards more sustainable investments. ESG framework in Kazakhstan, as was already mentioned by uh, our regulator, already quite well developed. Uh, we have uh, um, ecological codex, first of all, that uh, uh, defines terms of green and social projects, methodology of stock exchange that also defines requirements on the disclosure of ESG factors. We also have methodology of the Agency for Regulation and Development of Financial Market on issuance of green social uh, and sustainability bonds. And there are already a few green and social bonds issued on the uh, local stock exchanges. Uh, we also have in Astana International Financial Center Office of Green Finance Center, and they offer uh, consulting on green financing and sustainability. What we also observe globally is that asset managers and asset uh, owners show growing commitment to financing in ESG-related projects. ESG banking extends types of risks that are taken into consideration by the banks. Uh, this now also includes ecological, social governance aspects in risk management. And what uh, else? ESG banking extends uh, the horizon towards interest not only of the current, um, uh, current generation, but future generations as well. Another way how banks can influence is through uh, ESG development uh, in the promotion of more responsible business practices and transparency. Um, for Forte Bank, ESG topic is very relevant. We have our ESG principles and uh, um, targets set up in the strategy of the bank. Based on them, we are um, constantly involved in many social projects and in promotion of education, support of art, support of sports, uh, financial inclusion, and uh, charity. I want to finish my presentation with the statement that, in my view, uh, financial sector has resources to serve as a catalyst uh, for uh, ESG transformation in the society. Uh, we have already some regulatory framework, and uh, I know that there will be additional uh, legislative initiatives uh, on the way. Uh, we think that um, addition Integration of ESG principles into existing state programs and uh, maybe to the new state programs may also uh, be supplemental and will help to uh, develop uh, our economy in friend, ec ecologically friendly way. Um, this is uh, basically end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Alia, thank you very much indeed. A very good presentation. If I may ask you a quick follow-up question, you know, because you mentioned a lot, you know, that the bank and finance in general can be a catalyst for ESG transformation. And this is clearly what we are seeing, you know, after COP26, you know, the role of the financial sector to finance the zero net global economy. Do you see any concrete project in Kazakhstan, you know, in green finance at this moment that you are involved that can be quite interesting to, to reflect on? Well, uh, I think that um, 
Kazakhstan has a big potential for green financing. For instance, uh, uh, just for your information, Kazakhstan is ranked number three in terms of the size of the land um, suitable for organic uh, agriculture. Mm -hmm. And I think we have quite good potential here, but uh, maybe we need some more uh, economic incentives um, towards uh, to justify economics of such projects. We also have many projects related to the uh, power stations and uh, so on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's move on. And now we go to our next speaker, Liazat Ibragimova, the chairman of the board of Odbasi Bank. Please, over to you. Dear colleagues, today I would like to uh, have a speech with a small presentation and changes. Uh, please show my presentation. I would like to show example of uh, last two years that we have changes in our bank to see what will be the further steps. Kindly I'm asking to show the first slide. Uh, and the name and the title of the slide, we, I have three words with the uh, uh, conception of uh, unchangeability in changing circumstances. And I believe that it's important uh, that uh, to understand in, in near five years that uh, banks that are organizers have, uh, are providing the services for the population. So it means that our clients would like more and more services, online services exactly. So the exchange on uh, speed of the services because of the timing. Next slide, let's uh, remember 2020. In January, we were talking about the about the COVID-19. Then uh, the speech of the Bekshin uh, uh, coming of the COVID-19, the quarantine time, the panic. Then everybody went to uh, distance remote working system. It all started in January. And uh, on 28th of March, uh, the whole country was working through the distance. But if considered the last years, like two years before, it was it seemed like it was impossible. Actually, uh, we think that last years we were ready for this kind of work because we were adapting the distance learning, remote learning with the video, with the video pr provision. And we had the opportunity to study this kind of project and uh, to uh, have uh, the staff uh, to uh, teach the staff For example, uh, there were some uh, employees that did not understand the procedure of distance learning, that cannot read the uh, documents. So in this connection, it was important to teach to these people so these people can learn how to use and how to provide this kind of services. If we look at my slide carefully, so during this quarantine time, it was important to uh, support the team. Also, it had the 
reflection on the position of regulatory on in the whole world and we were working on loans uh, to uh, de delay the loans and we were giving this opportunity to the society it was like a first project f uh, during the 10 years of history of the banking system in our bank because we did not uh, require the uh, special like um, confirmation documentation so it's it is surprisingly that our clients uh, attitude was a bit different in our country in Kazakhstan we have uh, some kind of if you um, deprive the person of that, without approving documentation, then the a person thinks, well, if everyone receives it, maybe I shouldn't take it. And only 29,000 out of 125 loaners came to receive this extension but the rest said oh, we will just pay it and as of 2021 we see that it did not influence the quality of portfolio but uh, there were talks that if we pro provide the extension for the loan uh, the consumers will demand it all the time after we passed this stage, we understood the importance of uh, remote communication channels. We expand them, and now we, uh, for the f so we have uh, uh, transferred uh, several operations to the online banking. Now we are opening twenty-seven percent of deposits. So our clients now wish to uh, have these uh, services at home through online banking. And uh, so 56% of the operations of banking system now online. Maybe the key factor is that we have uh, employees we are uh, having uh, the process the uh, outsourcing team that are giving us uh, good results and that the productivity of the results uh, it depends on the team we had uh, 226 in 2020 now we have much more of them And uh, we have changed some um, requirements at, uh, in our agreements with our clients comparatively with other banks. And we are now uh, accepting online, uh, online um, online um, it can be a young girl or a middle-aged woman or a guy and we call them your individual professional who um, prepares your application fully uh, applying for loan remotely is possible now in 20 22 we will finalize this process and we will digitize it uh, returning to the beginning of my presentation i'd like to say that when uh, the pace is very important for a digital transformation the pace of uh, exchange of information with your clients you see uh, the business model differently now the model of banking services i think the future of banking sector will relate to the 
distribution of uh, functions because it's impossible to ensure the quickness of operations in one bank when one block works with the SMEs, second block works with the corporate consumers, and the third works with the physical persons. These are three different groups uh, with different demands and applications. Since we are a closed system of house construction um, savings and we only work with the, in the housing sector, we have two and a half uh, contributors. We need to deep um, to dive deeply in the sector and we need to work on all the projects related to the housing, not to provide other functions, not to work with the physical persons and just to improve the quality of operations that we provide now. And here we'll be able to establish institute that that will work on ensuring the housing. Of course, there are a lot of, a lot of people who criticized our system. They uh, say that we allegedly killed the, the system. But historically, uh, Odbasi is a family bank, but the success of a future banks will depend on a business model, appropriate business model, because in two, three years, all the services that are being digitized right now, they will be accessible in all the banks. They will be civ similar. Some of the services will be a standard and the model of each bank, the position of each bank and segmentation for clients is important. It would be difficult to work with as a big universal bank. Thank you so much. Thank you very much um, um, for this presentation. Clearly, you are also embarking in this digital transformation, and I think it was a very good, uh, you know, um, presentation to showcase, you know, clearly, you know, the change happening in the financial sector in, in your country. Let's move on now to our next speaker, Ibeck Kaipe, the chairman of the management board of Jusan Bank. Ibeck, over to you. And thank you for joining also. Yes, thank you, Mr. Jusan. Uh, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, let me take this opportunity to congratulate everyone on the upcoming uh, celebration of the Independence Day of our country. Uh, the rise of financial ecosystems or fintechs in general is already delivering uh, benefits to all stakeholders. Uh, consumers are the first ones to enjoy, uh, to benefit from a faster and in some cases cheaper financial products. Investors are happily in observing higher rates of return uh, to the equity and the financial market IT infrastructure is, be is becoming more uh, complex and lightweight at the same time. Uh, there are, what we see is that there are a number of reasons for such such a drive towards ecosystems, uh, but there there are two main reasons. Uh, the first one that uh, banking uh, banking activities in general are becoming um, uh, more expensive. Uh, the industry is becoming more expensive in general. The regulatory and compliance requirements, strict risk management procedures, and other factors are driving the global return on equity drop down. More than 50% of the of the global banks are already earning less than, than their cost of equity, and uh, the second uh, uh, the second most important reason for the ecosystem development is the is the shifting consumer preferences. Consumers are uh, looking to to get the product, the financial product, product at the place uh, where they interact. They want to get the product seamlessly, uh, and um, whether, the, whether it's a bank or, or marketplace. So it's inevitable that, that most of the bank, banks globally, they're shifting towards ecosystem models uh, in search of new, new revenue drivers, uh, new uh, income drivers. Uh, we at Jusan will also consider ecosystems as a way forward for the banking sector. Uh, over the course of two years, we've been able to launch a number of products and services that uh, support our development. Uh, as an example, for example, uh, our 
uh, flagship first flagship uh, investment services uh, product that allowed our consumers to invest globally into bonds and equities uh, from one banking applications. Uh, so more than 30,000 30, uh, of our clients are already enjoying this service. Uh, we, see, we also see that our uh, financial regulator is also supportive of the drive uh, towards digitalization, uh, which helps in, in, growth of, uh, in the growth of our ecosystem. Uh, re, uh, for, as an example, remote onboarding issuance of digi digital, digital cards, online issuance of credit cards, credit, uh, are some of the examples that allowed under our legislation. So while we all understand the benefits that are brought by uh, ecosystems and fintechs in general, we should also be aware of the risks that, that uh, these new models uh, bring to, to all stakeholders. So I, I would just name uh, just two of them. Uh, first one is the, uh, is the full information that uh, the client receives. I think we should be, as uh, financial players and the regulator, we should closely monitor uh, information that consumers get prior to acquiring certain financial product or a product uh, or a non-financial product where fin finances are hidden. Uh, so we should be all you know, be interested in our consumers getting all the full information. And secondly, ecosystems and fintechs in general are heavily dependent on the consumer data. So all the players on the market should be interested in the correct and uh, even playing fields, playing rules uh, for such data. So, uh, so we should avoid the breach of personal data or uh, loss of personal data uh, that can have a detrimental effect on the financial stability. Um, as an example, uh, regarding the information flow, uh, with the launch of our investment service, we simultaneously launched our uh, Jusan Academy, a platform where we teach our clients on the investment products and uh, their different features. So we, we try to provide full information to our clients. And uh, at the end, I would just like to mention that uh, uh, as one uh, of the key players in the financial market, we're all in, we're certainly interested in the legislation that supports ecosystem and fintech development. And we see that uh, it should be growing in our country in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Indeed, clearly a consensus here that uh, your country is really driving and is really embracing digital innovations of financial sector. So we are now, our next speaker will be very well placed, in fact, to talk about digital innovation which I think uh, can be a very good case in point to reflect about this new trend. Mikhaili Lomtadze, the head and co-founder of Caspi, will be now making a, his presentation. Welcome and looking forward to hearing from you. Over to you, please. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for our introduction. And uh, hello, every, all the participants of the, of the forum. Uh, can you guys pull up my presentation, please? Great, excellent, thank you. So let's move to the next slide. I mean, we as a company are really driven by the, by the mission which we have, which uh, is uh, stated as uh, improving people's lives by developing innovative products and services. So, uh, so Caspi KZ, we don't really have any limitations in terms of industries we want to work with or uh, type of products and services we want to introduce. Really, we are at the, at the heart of our business and the DNA of our business is our uh, determination to improve lives through the innovations and through the technology. And, uh, and we have been extremely successful in this Caspi KZ at the moment is one of the world's leading FinTech companies, but also is an example for many other companies in the world and, and benchmarked by many other companies in the world, our business model. Uh, moving to next slide. So just a brief overview of some of the, some of the elements of our business model is, uh, is the so core of our business is really a super app. Uh, everyone is talking about super app today, but Caspi has launched the super app, uh, actually back in 2017 and, uh, 
and it was one of very few super apps at that time. So super app means that all the services are in a single app mobile application and consumers can access those services through a single button on the screen of your smartphone. And that is, uh, is the most important, unique sort of uh, feature of our business. Today, everybody talks about super apps. In 2007, very few super apps existed in the world. So some of the services we have are bill payments. Bill payments, this is all payments around regular household needs, commission-free. So from utility to taxes and education, over 5,000 services consumers can access now and, and actually pay. Mobile payments and transfers, this is game-changing product which actually moved the country from cash to cashless. Uh, and here you have, you know, Cosby Gold prepaid debit card, which is the most popular debit card in the country, but also QR payments, for example, which were launched last year. And today QR payments is the, is the, is the most uh, penetrated payment method in, in the country as well. Uh, we have e-commerce, uh, which is the, the, the platform where you can buy items with the free delivery. So you, at the moment, we have almost 1.5 million listings on our e-commerce site. We work mostly with the Kazakh companies. Most of them are SMEs and, 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 and the number of the local brands. So we do promote the growth of SMEs, helping, helping the companies to develop their business. Mobile commerce is, is also the part of our marketplace business uh, where we're digitalizing the offline shopping experience and very unique product when you can also transact with a QR code, but you have, you know, groceries and the fitness clubs and, and the industries like that as a part of our business. Um, personal finance management, that's actually where we historically started. So uh, as, as, a, as a financial product, and we have a full scope of financial products now from products for consumers, buy now, pay later, consumer finance, savings, but also merchant products, which were increasingly rolling out as we speak. And and where, where we see very nice adoption on the SMEs for, uh, for financial products and working capital finance more specifically. And last year, we also entered the government services. This, this we partner with the government entities to help citizens in Kazakhstan to access government services through the mobile app. And, uh, and you know, at, the, at this point, the growth has been remarkable. The adoption has been remarkable. And we do believe that uh, Kazakhstan at the moment is probably one of the highest penetrated uh, countries by the government online services being accessible by the citizens uh, from anywhere from the screen of their phone and you can you can pay taxes you can register your business you can register a car uh, and and so on and so forth you can receive pensions benefit for newborns uh, so that's basically an overview of our business we also have a travel business which we launched last year and we constantly innovate by digitalizing the 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 daily needs of our consumers around their daily lives and it's a one app Next slide, please. Uh, that strategy remark, uh, it results in a remarkable adoption, which is the world-class standard. So at the moment, we have monthly users of around 11 million. Uh, and out of 11 million monthly users, uh, we have 6.5 million coming daily. So again, out of 10 people that actually come to our app on a monthly basis, six over six people come daily. So the engagement is about 6%, 60%. And that is one of the highest engagement uh, ratios in the world. So if you go to the slide number five, so you can actually see the benchmark of Caspi KZ against other apps. So we are actually, you know, one of the, uh, you know, top three super apps in the world. Uh, we are better than Amazon. Amazon has 30. Allegro, which is the largest uh, marketplace in Poland, has 36. Alibay in China has 50. And WeChat, because of their sort of gaming platform and the media platform, they have a higher engagement. So we are one of the most engaged super apps in the world. And Gaspi, as a case, has been presented to many other companies now. Uh, and, and that business has been developed in Kazakhstan, which is another source of the pride for every single employee of Gaspi and every single uh, top manager of Gaspi KZ. Next slide. So this is just a brief overview of some of the screens. So again, this is all one single app. So that's the most important feature of our business model. Uh, and, you know, I've mentioned e-commerce, bill payments, mobile payments, the QR, which is, you know, very convenient way of, of paying and accepting payments for consumers and SMEs, travel and government services, which I've mentioned, which were launched last, last year. Um, and again, we are revolutionizing the way people shop and pay but we are also digitalizing sort of everyday tasks uh, 
for our consumers uh, and the merchants. Next slide. This is an example of engagement of the government services. So 7 million people now accessing the section of our super app uh, of our government services. Again, people can pay, can check their COVID status, receive pensions, benefits. I mean, this is an incredible adoption. So over four times increase from a last year. And this is a, in a fantastic example of the company and the government and the government entities working together to make government services accessible to the citizens. Uh, another incredible example of us working together during the COVID lockdown, our team worked tirelessly to introduce the online uh, account opening, uh, also together with the National Bank and Ministry of Digitalization. And as a result of this incredibly hard work, I mean, we work basically 25 hours a day just to enable that service. Uh, we have been able to distribute the social benefits seamlessly through the online our super app to the online accounts and around 7 million distributions have been made and roughly two thirds of the distributions was done with the help of Caspi KZ. So our employees really worked day and night to enable the service and help our citizens to get social benefits seamlessly. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is now from last year, we're approaching SMEs. So we truly believe that SMEs have extraordinary needs to manage their business. There are very high quality SMEs across the country. Um, new companies being opened and built like coffee shops, even the, the micro businesses. So we've launched Caspi Pay Mobile app last year. And now SMEs can accept the payments through the QR code. They can issue instant invoices online to their consumers. They can get financing to, to grow and continue to develop their business. So that is extremely exciting uh, suit of the products. And again, we we find that there are a lot of SMEs that need the products. And unfortunately, traditional players have not been developing the high quality products for SMEs. So as soon as we started introducing those products last year, we have seen a remarkable growth. Next slide. This, for example, the sum of the products we have launched is a, is a POS, a mobile POS, Caspi QR checkout. Um, and we basically have uh, delivered those devices and solutions to our uh, merchants and SMEs uh, for free. Around two 215,000 POS solutions we have developed and delivered for free. And we have seen remarkable adoptions uh, of these products as well. So page number uh, 10, please. So here you see how the growth has been uh, taken. Uh, so we have we went through 35,000 micro small and medium-sized businesses in the third queue of last year to uh, 182,000 SMEs, uh, small, micro, and medium businesses in third Q21. So this is 182,000, and there is no indication of this slowing down. So there is a, there is a huge um, pool of the SMEs and the companies in Kazakhstan that need the services. And we were spot on by developing these high-quality products and have been able to help the SMEs to continue developing their business. So we're extremely excited about that. And again, before we entered the market, no high quality products were available to SMEs. SMEs were starving by for the solutions that would help them to grow their business. Now we have 182,000 SMEs connected to our platforms. Next slide. This is another uh, remarkable uh, growth that happened in Kazakhstan, which Kaspi KZ has been front runner of. So, you know, if you take the, 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 the view of the cashless payments, cashless transactions, in 2016, the cashless transactions for the whole year were 1.3 trillion. If you take 2021, we already are forecasting that over 73 trillion of the cashless transactions will take place in Kazakhstan. This is more than double from last year. But at the same time, it's just a remarkable growth. I mean, basically, I think within the just the two or three weeks of the of the month in 2021, we're processing more cashless transactions than for the whole year of 2016. So remarkable growth. It took just five years, and I truly believe that this is one of the most remarkable transformations in any economy in the world. When in five years you can move from cash to cashless, 170 billion of cashless transactions forecasted for by us in 2021. Next slide. Here you can see the transformation in numbers. So around 13% of all the transactions in 2016 were actually done cashless. 
only 13%. In 2021, 78 percent of all the transactions being done cashless and that has a enormous benefits for the economy that fuels gdp growth consumers are you know they love seamless and convenient ways of move the money but also it brings a lot of transparency and and, and again i mean it, it brings costs down for moving the cash around so that's extremely sort of powerful and incredible transformation which has taken place next slide and, you know, Caspi being a benchmark for many companies in the world uh, and putting the country on the on the world's innovation map, really. Everybody thought that Kazakhstan is just a natural resources company. And now everybody talks about Kazakhstan as a, as a, as a home for companies like Caspi KZ. And Harvard Business School wrote a case about Caspi KZ uh, uh, that is taught as a part of MBA curriculum in the second year. So again, you know, we're extremely proud that Caspi KZ is the company which has been born in Kazakhstan and technologies are being developed in Kazakhstan. The products being developed by our team locally. So this is an enormous source of pride for our entire team. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to reinforce that Caspi KZ is the company which was born and made in Kazakhstan by our team here. Every single product we develop is developed in Kazakhstan by our team. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mikhail. It's a great presentation. And I think uh, from someone from outside Kazakhstan, we learned clearly that innovation is already there in Kazakhstan with, with your innovation. I have a quick question, if I may. Um, what's about cross-border payment? You know, in Central Asia, you know, remittances are critical. Are you planning something in terms of facilitating uh, and reducing the cost of cross-border payment, or is too early? Or you so that uh, would be interesting to hear from you on this. Sure, I mean that's one of the products and the services which we're developing. Uh, so we, uh, you know, you are spot on because we're just about to to launch on a full scale integration with other payment uh, networks. Uh, like Amir in Russia, uh, and we're working also in Central Asian uh, countries. So again, the, our priority here is just to enable, you know, our initial idea was driven by the mission, improving people's lives. We wanted our consumers and their families seamlessly move the money between the countries. But as we started to develop these businesses, we realized that it's just much bigger uh, opportunity because there is a lot of trade that is happening between Kazakhstan, Russia, Uzbekistan, and other Central Asian countries. So, Mark, you're exactly right. I mean, this is one of our products we're just uh, launching already, uh, and, and we'll be launching sort of full scale in our mobile app uh, very soon. So our users will have ability to move the money between Kazakhstan and other countries uh, of the region. Very, very interesting. If I may now get back to, to Mr. Somolyakov, you know, Oleg, I have a quick question for you. You know, we just um, uh, heard Mikhaili related to his presentation. How, from a, a regulatory point of view, you know, you, you pay attention to, to Caspi, you know, in terms of uh, business model, in terms of any risk related to, you know, in you know, like as he mentioned, you know, in his presentation, you know, small and medium companies are now part of this ecosystem and they were part of the informal economy of Kazakhstan. So number one is clearly any concern about uh, regulation. Uh, this is an opportunity for increasing financial inclusion in Kazakhstan. How do you see the rise of these new, you know, institutions and what are the implications for regulation? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. It's really a disputable question, <clears throat> which we may spend for several hours maybe to discuss, but I will try to be brief. So I think that the main risk are basically the same irrespective of the model of the bank. There may be maybe certain particularities related to the uh, more for, for the concentration on the retail uh, banking or the, the e-payment or mobile payment. Well, I think that the risk is the same. The bank should have a clear and uh, uh, I mean, sophisticated system of underwriting. So they, have, they should have uh, uh, clear business processes. Um, uh, they, have to, they should have a, a good uh, a digital system in the bank and uh, they should comply with the standards that we actually <clears throat> set behind them. Uh, we think that uh, the, the point that I mentioned in the, the beginning is that 
we are moving to the risk oriented approach and that's where we see the huge benefit not only for the control of the risk but also for the development of the new business models or the existing one because this uh, risk-based supervision is basically fine-tuned to each particular risk of the banks so we think that it will provide the necessary balance uh, allowing those banks that have better systems of risk control to, be, uh, to uh, develop faster as well as controlling uh, those banks and stimulating them to uh, make their systems more efficient as of the new challenges of the ecosystems and marketplaces uh, currently that we uh, discuss with banks uh, the risk is we will see certain particular risks related, for example, to the protection of the data, but we also see the huge uh, benefits of uh, opening up these systems to other particular to other, uh, to other um, services providers or even to financial institutions. I think that uh, sometimes we uh, um, unfair opposed to uh, words uh, cooperation and competition i think that sometimes cooperation especially you see us thinking from the point of view of developing the ecosystems and providing the better services to the clients i think cooperation will in improve competition and uh, it will make the competition fair and it's also the client centric it uh, uh, prioritizes the, the uh, points and benefits of the client and I think that opening up of the systems, uh, uh, allowing more uh, service and product providers to enter particular ecosystems of the banks, it's, that's the area where we see most of potential. Thank you indeed. Let me see if we have received some questions from our audience here, uh, receiving from um, you know the technology, you know the WhatsApp technology here, uh, receiving from. Um, from the audience. I think maybe one quick question from all our panelists here. I mean, is, thank you for all of you, in fact, for a very interesting discussion in terms clearly about the, the transformation happening in the financial sector in your country, but also at the global level. So, you know, the other, you know, like it's clear that um, COVID-19, you know, has been maybe a driving force to what people are calling, you know, building back better. And clearly maybe this has helped you know the financial sector in, in in Kazakhstan also to improve you know you know service to customers to small and medium companies now when we think about the next challenging that we are all facing here at the global level clearly you know the transition toward the net zero economy how do you see this transformation also as an opportunity for 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 for, for the financial sector and two the other major change that is going to happen at the global level and also within your country and the region is clearly the emergence of central bank digital currency. Do you see that as a threat for the financial sector? Is we are moving away or are we going to keep central bank money going to the financial sector? So from a banker point of view, how you see maybe the emergence of CBDC? Over to anyone. Alia, over to you first. Uh, this is very complicated question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not uh, IT specialist, uh, maybe to correctly answer whole details. But what I think myself is that uh, this is truly the trend: the move to the cashless operations, to move to the uh, digital um, transformation of all banks, and maybe competition is really strong here. What um, our bank did uh, during COVID, um, also we were quite quick in um, shifting to digital channel um, uh, provision of the uh, deferrals to, of payments to our clients and to provide uh, more services, including digital lending and digital onboarding to uh, not only to retail customers, but also to um, SME. Still, there are a lot of things that we are working on, and for digital currency, I think this is on a, 
uh, state level uh, important uh, movement. Um, to me, this is more, um, it, it will help to reduce maybe some gray area in uh, transact on the, um, like not, uh, uh, not uh, fully banked, uh, bankable uh, transactions between uh, uh, physical, between, between individuals and between businesses. So I think this will bring more transparency to the economy. So from my perspective, I think this, is, this will be a good movement. Thank you. Anyone else on the panel? Yes, uh, Michael, please, over to you. Sure. I mean, in terms of the transformation really, the, the environment transform faster than the companies can, right? So, I mean, you cannot develop the technology capabilities uh, in overnight. I mean, even 12 months is not enough. So the, the main sort of danger for financial institutions and the risk in the environments of COVID is that you actually have to start introducing the products which you have not been doing for many years. And those products are working terribly. The user experience is terrible. Mobile apps are not opening. The download is not possible. Login is not possible. Just the basic stuff, which doesn't make those products accessible. So there is a huge difference between announce the product and actually product working. So I think that's the major challenge for many financial institutions. In our case, that has been, uh, uh, I mean, we're fit for this type of environment. I mean, we started with online services I mean, our first online services, bill payment, commission-free bill payments, we started in 2012. So from our perspective, I mean, our relevance has been just reinforced. But in general, I would say the major challenge for any traditional companies, not even banks, I mean, they have really to change really fast. And the change usually happens with the mentality of, you know, technology and, you know, looking at some companies making announcements or the, talking about the products I mean, you clearly see these people have never done any decent products in their lives, but they keep talking about them. So that's that's the biggest challenge, I think. Second, about the about the digital currency. I mean, this is a great idea. You know, if I would exclude the sort of the fashion component of it, like everyone talks about it, that should not be part of the equation. If digital currency brings reduction of costs on the transactions, that will be beneficial for everyone. It will be beneficial for consumers. It will be beneficial for stockholders. So that's basically we understand is the main uh, idea behind digital currency, apart from more of a security and flexibility and controls. So we are we're definitely excited if that would bring reducing costs to the consumers and the players in the market. This this would be a great uh, idea to execute. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I think this time is up. I just received a message from our organizer that we need now to, to conclude. Let me thank all of you on behalf of the organizer for you know, participating to these very interesting sessions on about uh, innovation. We are going to shift with the next one clearly on the uh, session which is going to be raise the global macroeconomic policy environment in the still ongoing era of coronavirus pandemic. That will be our next session that, will be, that I will have the pleasure to share also. Let me thank all the sponsors, all the organizers uh, for making this session possible. And uh, coming from Paris, I also want to also uh, congratulate the Republic of Kazakhstan for your anniversary of the independence. We are looking forward for the next 30 years, building back better, more green, more digital, and more local. And we look forward to seeing you in person, hopefully, next year. Thanks so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank Take you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Shall we start, uh, Pavel? Okay, I think I got the green light. Okay, everyone, good afternoon, good morning, and welcome to the second session of the G Global Congress entitled Global Macroeconomic Policy Environment in the Ongoing Era of the Coronavirus Pandemic. You remember a year ago when we met, we discussed post-pandemic. So it looks like we are back to square one and we are going to discuss clearly the current global economic outlook that it is driven by two major characteristics, a divergent global economy that are going to have major consequences. This week, the main central bank of the US 
of the ECB and the Bank of England are going to meet to discuss, you know, prospect of current economic outlook, a change of their monetary policy stance. And this, I think, gives us a very good background to have an interesting conversation with high-level speakers about where do we stand in terms of macroeconomic prospect for the global economy. Are we going to see from a period where we have low inflation, low interest rate, low growth to a period where we are going to shift maybe to a different macroeconomic stance with higher growth, higher interest rate, and higher inflation. This is going to be the, the conversation we're going to have with uh, very high level speaker coming from different parts of the world. Let me introduce uh, them to you. And after I will give you the scenario about how we are going to conduct our conversation. Romano Prodi, welcome Romano, is the former prime minister of Italy, former president of the European Commission is with us. Thanks for joining. Professor Ken Rogoff, the professor of economics at Harvard University and the former chief economist of the IMF. Ken, welcome. Uh, we, I know that uh, Rebecca Greenspan will be joining tomorrow the plenary sessions. Uh, she's the Secretary General of UNCAD. Governor Martin Gashtan, the Governor of the Central Bank of Armenia. Governor, welcome. Thank you for joining. Barozan Bektimirov, the Chief Economist of the Astana International Financial Center. Perspective from the financial market, Massimiliano Castelli, the Head of Global Strategy in Global Foreign Markets at UBS Global Asset Management and Li Jin Yan, the chairman of the Secret Group and the member of the Strategic Direction Committee of UNCTAD. And we will conclude with Serik, the head of the International Secretary of G Global, who will give us the final conclusions. So clearly, you know, the way we would like to conduct that, um, that session is clearly to get a sense about the perspective of the global economic outlook that has been really characterized by divergence, unevenness, of the global economy, and openness to access to vaccine. We all know that vaccination is the number one instrument of economic policy. And we know, unfortunately, that the virus is clearly the driver of the global macro policymaking decision at this moment. So as I mentioned to you, the major central bank will announce you know, some major change, maybe in their monetary policy stance, that give us a framework about what's happening in the global economy, we are seeing, you know, higher inflation in advanced countries, particularly in the U.S. and also in Europe. Emerging markets are in between. They have already tightened interest rate as they want to preempt. Maybe some concern about infl already inflation in their countries, but also concern about tapering and spillover effect from a change of monetary policy in the U.S. And also, we all know that um, we are seeing, you know, major challenges because. Unfortunately, COVID-19 is still with us, so there is still stop and go in terms of prospect of the global economy. In order to kick off the conversation, I'm going to ask um, our first speaker, Romano Prodi, to give, him, to give us also a view from Europe, particularly about the ongoing recovery in Europe, but also the challenges, particularly the divergence that we might see between country from the north versus country from the south, you know, and can we see also the change that's been happening in Europe and particularly in the Eurozone with the change of um, the macroeconomic policy framework and the importance, you know, uh, actions by government of the EU, you know, to provide and to build it back better. Romano, over to you. Microphone. And you, thank you. Okay, you are right. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. And I, 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 I shall be, uh, I hope to be very simple and brief because, uh, you know, your questions are uh, so great in dimension and in deepness. But first of all, terminology. Till a couple of months ago in Europe, we were debating inflation or non-inflation. Now we are debating temporary or non-temporary inflation. So the debate is totally changed. Inflation is already here, but in a strange way, you know, a little less than five percent, uh, and uh, but uh, more in Germany than in Italy, uh, uh, in a very very strange way. There is a, an atmosphere of a Germany uncertain. Maybe for the political crisis, maybe I don't know for other reasons. But uh, even in terms of uh, recovery, we have uh, Italy recovering uh, 
six uh, percent or a little more than six percent and uh, much more than uh, uh, Germany even if the decrease the cycle was much worse south and north Europe you know but in this moment you cannot tell north and Europe are divided in some sense uh, the countries that were decreasing more are uh, now in a, increasing more uh, the country who decreased less uh, are now decreasing more you know the problem is uh, the new political the new european policy this is uh, the real problem you know because uh, we already started the debate uh, concerning the increasing of debt and the harmony of the different uh, uh, policies that we have in the different states. Uh, for example, uh, you, you understand that there is a general debate, uh, almost an obsession about uh, uh, environmental problem, about the uh, shifting to that, you know, and uh, the necessary but uh, and uh, we have uh, the European Union has correctly uh, set it very severe goals, much more severe than any other part of the globe. But now the debate is like that. You know, we have we are responsible for seven percent. Uh, of pollution in the world in the wide sense and uh, even if uh, if we apply very severe uh, decisions which will be the outcome uh, our cost of production will increase uh, too much so we be able to be the forefront of the change if there are not agreement with china and united states when Europe, we, we will able to to keep the the speed of the change. Uh, this is the debate because it's not an abstract debate because there are many, uh, not only in the business area, but uh, who say, look, we are spending a fantastic amount of money of public subsidies for solar energy, but all the hardware is Chinese produced, one hundred percent, and so. If we generalize that, which will be uh, the consequence on European industry, you know, this is in the long term, this is debate. In the short term, I, but this is very simple, we are obsessed by the problem of scarcity of some wood, of chips, of raw material, increasing price of energy, and this but this is a, a, an absolutely common debate that you have uh, everywhere. You have in the United States, you have in China, you have everywhere. And I don't want, I want to insist on that, but it's very serious because uh, 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 if I assist to some factories who are simply stopped because they are, they cannot have but even very simple raw material like aluminum or copper you know, that is absolutely out of any my previous imagination you know. but i repeat this is not a european problem the european problem is is our choice so traditionally more severe on environment uh, be uh, accompanied by such a strong technical change that will make Europe leader, or will shall we uh, depend uh, by uh, by shall we uh, damage European uh, structure with higher cost of, of of production of other uh, of uh, other continents? This is the real debate. Thank you, Romano. Thank you very much. Let's move on now to, to Ken Rogoff. Ken, please, over to you. Clearly, you know, the debate on inflation in the U.S. has been, you know, quite active. You know, we shifted from the question about permanent versus transitory to say, well, this is now a big pivot coming from the Fed. How do you characterize the U.S. economy? We are not talking anymore about recovery, but maybe expansion. And you see from a global macro perspective that we might 
be shifting from a period of higher inflation, higher growth, and higher interest rates? Or it's too, too early to tell? Over to you, Katie. Thank you for joining. Uh, microphone? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark, and uh, thank you uh, uh, to the conference organizers for inviting me. Um, listen, I think the concerns not that we're shifting to higher growth, higher inflation, but much more likely lower growth, higher inflation. I think that's really the you know the concern of where we might be headed now. Let me start by talking uh, narrowly about the debate in the United States. Uh, then expanding on to look more broadly at the global economy uh, briefly. So there's, I think, you know, little question in the United States that the Federal Reserve has fallen behind the curve. Uh, does it mean, you know, it made mistakes? Well, we, we were in this incredible pandemic. Uh, things could have gone much worse. They had a very loose monetary policy as a form of insurance against the bottom falling out. And I, I don't want to just criticize them for saying you did the wrong thing because now uh, the pandemic is tapering in the United States, uh, growth is picking up and now there's all this inflation. I mean, I, th I think that's really what uh, you know we call <laughs> here uh, Monday morning quarterbacking, referring to football games that happen on Sunday. Um, it's, it's good that the economy is growing, but there's no question that given how the recovery has really been better than I think people have predicted, uh, the Federal Reserve has fallen behind the curve. And it's not that easy to dig your way out. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, Roman Prati said uh, first the debate was no inflation, now it's transitory or not. I think the United States has shifted to be, is it long lasting? Is it forever? Uh, and, and of course, there are the tools to reduce inflation. You could raise interest rates enough, uh, as Paul Volcker did in the, uh, in the early 1980s. But it's a very different world today. Uh, in the early 1980s, the stock market was very low. Debt was very low. Uh, house prices were certainly not at the levels that we seen today. And trying to raise interest rates in this environment too much, too fast, is going to be very challenging. Or I should say that another way, trying to raise interest rates as much as might be needed to really stem inflation, I think, could prove very challenging. So right now, all the polls are complaining about inflation. Wait till they start raising interest rates and see what the polls start complaining about. It's a, it's a very... They've, they're definitely backed into a corner, uh, and I don't think it's that easy for them uh, to get out. Uh, part of the problem, I think, broadly, and I would say this across the whole world, was uh, too many people diagnosed this as a demand shock. There's low demand. Maybe there's something else, but it's demand. And we've learned when there's a demand shock, you just throw everything at it, as much macro stimulus, as much monetary stimulus. And as I know, I argued here a year ago, it's not just a demand shock. There's a very big supply shock. There are many levels of it. The supply chain problems we're experiencing. I, again, I was listening to the previous speaker and thinking, you know, here uh, one day uh, you can't buy washing machines. Another day you can't get croissants. Uh, there's something missing from the ingredients that the baker needs. I mean, the supply chain problems are really profound. And uh, some of that will resolve over the next coming months. But I think some of it is longer lasting as the pandemic circulates, as some of the pushback from globalization uh, goes on. So here in the United States, um, I, I think uh, there isn't going to be a quick solution. And I will say the markets do not see a big problem. If you look at financial market indicators, for example, there are measures of what markets expect inflation to be in five to 10 years. There are measures of what markets expect interest rates to be in five to 10 years. Then the markets by and large think that it's mostly transitory. The Federal Reserve can raise interest rates modestly and slowly, and there just isn't going to be inflation. I, 
I think that's uh, there's a much bigger risk that in two years we're going to be seeing, say, three and a half and four percent inflation and growth still challenging so that they can't raise interest rates that much. Let me just briefly extend, make a couple of comments about uh, the world. Uh, a very big player in this is China, uh, which has also been going through quite a slowdown this year. I think there are many factors to it. I won't go into it there, uh, go into it now, but obviously this radiates out into the world, not simply with demand for commodities, but the, the very rapid Chinese growth has been a big driver of disinflation over the last uh, 20 years, and that could be something going into reverse. So I've said that the Federal Reserve is behind the curve. I think another organization that's behind the curve is the International Monetary Fund. Uh, if we're looking at what's going on in the rest of the world, uh, in emerging markets and developing economies, uh, it's certainly a very, very difficult situation. I mean, it varies across regions, but on the whole, uh, the 21st century has had been one of convergence until the last few years where the poor and middle income countries by and large were growing faster than the richer countries. That ended a few years ago, but uh, we've had a, a long period where despite all the uh, you know, uh, hand wringing about inequality. Uh, Thomas Piketty. It's it's actually been was a very good period, but it's gone into reverse, and the situation is very difficult. And if you look at many emerging markets today, uh, their resources are really strained. They obviously face the pandemic, uh, the hospitalization issues, people having to quarantine. Uh, you can go on and on. They face the same challenges as everyone else. At the same time, the debt markets are much less forgiving. And although global interest rates are low and many countries uh, have been able to pull in enough revenue, and I would also say reforms that have taken place the last 20 years with deeper domestic markets, it's becoming more strained. I, I think the United States and Europe can borrow a lot more without immediately driving up interest rates. I'm not necessarily that's a great idea, but that capacity does not necessarily exist in emerging markets. At the same time, it, you know, there are many countries that have inflation 10%, 20%, 40%. And I, I come back to what I said about the International Monetary Fund, because I think early on in the pandemic, the IMF very rightly uh, was saying, you know, that this is a very scary situation. This is a time to take risks. Uh, don't worry about uh, fiscal policy. Don't, you know, just do whatever you can, whatever the markets will permit you. But I think this sort of attitude has gone on for a long time without really now counterbalancing it with more traditional conditionality. And I could point to one country after another where the IMF programs, uh, IMF's been lending money, sort of turning a blind eye to uh, import restrictions on food, uh, to obviously unsustainable debt problems. And so we enter the next year to conclude, uh, probably the United States might not raise interest rates enough to really kill off inflation but it's going to raise interest rates more and it's going to be comfortable for international markets. And uh, I, I fear we're going to see a lot of sectors under stress and certainly uh, many developing economies, frontier emerging markets, emerging markets. So I, I, I definitely think this is a very difficult situation. We, we can hope for the best that the Federal Reserve doesn't have to raise interest rates very much. And then I think There'll still be many problems, but there'll be less. Let me just lastly pick up on the environment. I should just say something about that. Boy, I, I think people just aren't prepared for what the transition will involve. Uh, I see so many central banks trying to turn their eye towards trying to decide what the energy mix should look like in 30 or 40 years. That's an important question. I think it should be done by governments and the fiscal authorities. 
but they don't spend enough time thinking about the transition. Look, look at what happened in Europe this summer when there wasn't enough wind uh, in Texas, uh, where uh, again, they move very quickly in a transition. California, I, I applaud moving in a transition, but the problems we're facing with the pandemic with supply chain problems are probably just a taste of what we'll experience when we do the necessary transition in the environment. So uh, I am optimistic that the global economy is recovering, but there are many challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much indeed for this good panorama of uh, not only about the U.S. you know prospect, but also for uh, for the emerging market and uh, the challenge they face. And I give you give me a good transition to as a governor, Martin. Please over to you and maybe to reflect on uh, Ken comments related, you know, to the emerging market. You know, they were the driver of growth. You know, in the previous decade, is it not going to be the case? What is going to be from your perspective also, from where you are also, you know, the new driver for growth uh, on UN. Over to you. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank organizers and fellow panelists for, for this opportunity. Very big welcome to Romano Prodi. Hope all is well on your end. Um, I think I'll, I'll touch upon several points that Ken just made and then try to bring the emerging market perspective to those. Probably question number one that I want to raise is what are the structural changes that the world economy will undergo after the pandemic? And in the emerging market context, will we see hysteresis effects at all? To answer this, probably we need to understand the pace and the structure of economic recovery. I see it to be... Uh, unevenly distributed between developing and the developed world. And there are several reasons for that and several were mentioned by Ken. First, to my understanding is the fiscal policy. So in developed world, uh, there was much expansionary fiscal policy during the pandemic. And our research shows that the reason behind is that they had much more capacity and they had much more fiscal space, which was not the case for developing countries and emerging economies. And I would like to mention, as Ken did, the capacity part. Secondly, the same applies to monetary policy, I would say. Uh, indeed, emerging markets have much less space to look through the external and supply shocks uh, probably because of imperfect credibility that the central banks and the emerging markets have. Therefore, from my perspective, the probability of negative hysteresis is much higher in emerging markets than in developed countries. Second issue that I'll briefly touch upon will be the problem of public debt. So we were talking about inflation being transitory or it is, as, as Powell mentioned in Congress, it is here to stay with, with US, definitely with us sometime as well. But both emerging and uh, advanced countries' public debt had significantly increased during the pandemic. And even uh, if we all understood that uh, it should be done, whatever it takes to bring the economy back on their feet, but at the same time, fiscal discipline, to my understanding, is a crucial factor. And if markets decide not to punish at this stage the developed world, that's not the case with the developing one. And there we are be witnessing uh, the problem of the risk premium. So what will happen to emerging markets if Fed decides to go and to normalize the stuff? by tapering or further on by increasing the interest rates. What would happen to emerging markets which are lacking the discipline in their fiscal accounts and their public debt? Uh, to my understanding, even if Fed does it in a very orderly manner, and I probably agree with Ken that they are here behind the curve. Nevertheless, if they, even they succeed in doing it in an orderly manner, the risks for emerging markets uh, are not zero. I think there are much risks built up during the pandemic era where they decided to expand their fiscal accounts. 
So it's the game that, that we should see what the outcome is. And paradoxically, when we think about Fed being hawkish, it sounds like a good news because um, it may somehow anchor global inflation expectations. But at the same time, we understand that the issue of idiosyncratic risks to different countries, depending on their stance during the pandemic, is a very interesting question to look at. And probably last but not least from my perspective is the question of, um, and we were debating it over and over again, whether it's a demand shock, whether it's a supply shock. To my understanding, that was both. And I would like to mention that the Central Bank of Armenia was probably one of the first emerging market central banks which increased the interest rates. We did it early December last year when our inflation was well below the target rate. But by anticipating the credibility issues and by trying to anchor the inflation expectations, we make a very big move by increasing the interest rates right at the outset by one percentage point. Now, we believe that we're closer to the, to the end of the tightening cycle. But nevertheless, the question that I want to raise here is what if supply chain disruptions persist for a longer period than we expected? Can we blame the supply factors and do nothing at this point? Or we should take into consideration the inflation expectation part of the equation and then at least do something with that. I'm a strong believer in discipline, and I think that we should be acting further than later. And to my understanding, even if we blame the supply factors, we should act. And to, 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 from where I sit, one of the risks that I see by looking to the world around me is this independence issue of the central bank. Would central bank dare be hawkish in their behavior or there will be these political economy factors influencing our decision further on? And we do have very bad examples across the emerging market. So these are the questions that I think we should keep in mind. And thank you very much again. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Governor. Let's uh, now move on to our next speaker. Bauer Bekimirov, the chief economist of uh, Astana International Financial Center. Bauer, over to you. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, uh, thank you for the organizers for, for inviting me to this um, very interesting panel and very talented speakers. So first of all, before I even go to my main points, I just wanted to quickly react to the, to the governor's comments about uh, political economy being important. I think at this time, so we have to take it that, into account political economy, but it's not it, in bad interpretation, but in terms of we have to look for the overall for public good. We have to create public good. We have to create common good. So that's why we have to take into account this, this things. And uh, of course, the central bank should be independent. But then at this moment, um, I would care about the well-being, about the common good of the, of the citizens. But I think when we talk about the macroeconomic trends, it's very important. And one, one cannot escape talking about the, the environment agenda and the whole, I think, COP26 was a very, very big event this year. It perhaps is one of the most important events this year because now we have the, you know, countries committing to specific KPIs, to the NDCs, and this agenda has moved from the, I know, rather minor group of discussion. When you know, We had this discussion two years ago at the World Economic Forum, but today it's on the agenda of, of every policymaker. And uh, it, it has become evident that the climate change agenda is here, it's here to stay, and the ESG principles have become, you know, it's, it's a broad term again, we don't want to you know, go into details, but that's affect our uh, socioeconomic policies and we have to take into account that. So when we talk about the COP26 and then the national NDC, the national defined contributions, they're definitely far from perfect mechanism. It doesn't raise free riding, there's a lot of, there's lack of equity across different countries. I think that's not fair because we have different countries. The world is very, very heterogeneous. There's so much difference between different level, uh, countries on different levels. There are plus industrial countries, agriculture countries, industrial cultures. So it just, uh, we need to talk, we need to find solutions. I think, you know, the example of Euro Europe, it's interesting when we have, when they have the P455 and green, the new green deal, I think that's 
again, those are not perfect policies, but there's something that we have to think about as a global community. But this leads me to the main point of intervention that's very well articulated by Professor Rogoff, the challenge of rising inequality, because the inequality is something that uh, has been uh, rising in the uh, last five years or four or five years, but the, the pandemic and the whole situation in the world has just exacerbated the problem because uh, developed countries and developing countries have different means to fight the pandemic. We, you know, the previous speakers have been talking about the fiscal space and obviously more rich, the richer countries and more developed countries had more ample fiscal space, more instruments to fight the pandemic. And uh, the, the, the you know, poorer countries didn't have this instrument. So the, the divide has increased and the, the marginal utility of each dollar in different countries is very different. And it's when we talk about the long lasting effect that uh, Professor Rogoff was talking about, I think that uh, inequality, if we don't do anything, will become something lasting and it's, uh, and it's self fueling. That's because the longer we, we, we go forward, it, you know, the, the situation will not improve unless we have some top down policies at the international level. So uh, if we look, for example, at capital markets, it's also very, very interesting that how we see the divide. I was just looking another day at the stock of the LVMH, the Louis Vuitton Maya Chandon. From March 2020 until this day, it gained 120%. So the luxury goods have gained 120%, and they're doing very well. And that just shows how, you know, how unequal our world is, and then unequal you know, among the countries, within one country, and on the global scale as well. And look at the Tesla stocks, for example. So I think uh, in 2022, and uh, we'll talk about macroeconomic environment, the countries will continue to pursue their national strategies. Unfortunately, everyone is now uh, you know, thinking about, because when you have problems, first of all, you think about your own country, and then you think about international cooperation. And unfortunately, that's something that we have, and then the politicians, you know, you have the election period, et cetera. So that's something that we have to leave. In Kazakhstan, and because I represent Kazakhstan, and Kazakhstan has been one of the key, uh, I think, vocal leaders in, in, in organizing this international dialogue. I think G Global is also a very, very great initiative because we have to come together and talk. So in Kazakhstan, we were lucky because we had some fiscal space and we had uh, enough resources to support the people during the lockdown. And we were able to prioritize our efforts and uh, support the economy. So I would say that Kazakhstan is doing, I know, pretty well compared to other developing and emerging markets. Uh, but then, because we had some opportunities and to, to be very close to big markets, we had opportunities to have fiscal space. And then uh, the government was also acting very, very uh, fast last year because um, we had, last year it was created the Supreme Council reforms. There's a new agency of reform that actually met almost every month and decided on very quick macroeconomic policies. And right now, uh, this, the, this agencies are redesigning the social code. They're redesigning a lot of documents just to help uh, people and address the inequality on different levels. So I think uh, the countries hopefully will deal with that. And uh, I really hope that other countries can also pick up. I hope really the developing countries and the international institutions such as the IMF, which was mentioned today already, will help because uh, at the moment I'm preoccupied with the lack of coordination at the global scale. There was a very strong criticism of uh, Mount Central Development Bank, and the IMF in particular. So uh, Dr. Rogoff, colleague, uh, Ricardo Hausmann, was very, very vocal about it. He said, actually, developing countries should help and the IMF should do something. It's not, uh, and he was very vocal about it. It's not because there is no instruments, because he was comparing that to the previous crisis of, uh, you know, the debt crisis in Europe, and then at that time, IMF put and fourth about one trillion US dollars package. And today we don't have that. I think all the MDBs and MF together have about, you know, 500, 600 uh, billion US dollars. And it's not enough, it's not comparable even though we have the crisis on the global scale, not on the European scale. So he was criticizing it for the, for the inequality also in approach, but then uh, I would leave it to my more experienced colleagues. So I don't have the immediate answer. I, I know for sure that we need dialogue, we need, uh, you know, places like G Global, we need places, uh, you know, the discussion platforms. I think EU is doing well just because they have this platform on the supranational level. So that's why uh, I would like to mention the connectivity again, that we have to be connected. Uh, one 
point is the, the you know, physical connectivity. Mm -hmm. We talk about the supply chain, but also digital connectivity and connecting our policies, being more consistent policies across the countries as well. So we have to build bridges in both uh, figurative and literal way, and I hope we will succeed at it. We don't really have a choice at this moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bauer. Let me now give the floor to Massimiliano Castelli. Max, if I maybe may ask you, you know, one of the questions, you know, really provide us, you know, maybe different scenario coming from the financial market in terms of global economic outlook. And if you can reflect also about uh, prospect for capital flow for emerging market, you know, we see that we are a little gloomy on EM, you know, do you see a drying up of capital flow in EM at this moment? Max, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, thanks for the invitation. I feel a little bit uh, shy to be in a panel with uh, some uh, some of the distinguished uh, panelists. First, first of all, Romano Prodi is uh, someone that we've been meeting in Kazan for many, many years. But also, let me say, uh, Ken Rogoff, uh, it's, it's, uh, I spend uh, many nights on your book of international macroeconomics during my doctoral stu studies. So I remember that with great pleasure. Anyway, th so say that I would like to really give a little bit, uh, uh, a, a little bit of financial market uh, perspective. Maybe let me immediately make a disclaimer, which is you know financial markets, they probably have a positive bias. Uh, traditionally, they tend to see always the glass half full. I mean, we, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, the, the, so say that I believe that uh, we should reflect first of all where we are coming from. And uh, first of all, 2020 has been uh, a year of incredibly high return for the investors. If you look at both across fixed income and equities and over risky assets, we some of the investors that I deal with, particularly institutional investors, they had some of the best return of the last decade. And this has actually been a continuation of a trend which has been going on, I would say, since the great financial crisis. If you look at 2021, it is uh, very similar to 2020 in terms of equity returns, and in general, returns are going to be good with one exception. What is new in 2021 uh, from an investment perspective is, of course, the increase in yields that we experienced since early September, which have a big impact on, uh, in particular, investors who are very much focused on the fixed income asset, like for instance, government bonds, corporate bonds. Actually, I will go back to that because that's something relatively new for the eventual uh, post-pandemic world, particularly if we remain in this sort of uh, high inflation and uh, rising interest rate environment, at least for the medium term. So 2021 is likely to be another year of good from an investment perspective. Now, the question uh, one might ask if is you're not an investor who live uh, and read uh, the financial markets every day is why in front of the worst economic recession of the, as they claim, of the post-war period, and in front of a pandemic which is devastating many economies, or as they said, many economies, why financial markets have been so, let's say, benign, have such a benign outlook? Well, I think there are actually some good arguments for that uh, benign outlook. If you look at also from an economic perspective and not purely from a financial perspective. I mean, first of all, and I think uh, Professor Rogoff pointed out, uh, the recovery in a certain extent has been very, very spectacular and unexpected. Nobody expected really the recovery to be so strong. There was a view that, you know, the damage which has been done during the lockdown would have been much more enduring. And I believe that many, uh, including us, have been underestimating uh, probably the, the adap adaptability uh, of individuals to new economic conditions, which is also something important to keep in mind as we fight the new variant of the pandemic. Secondly, of course, it was about the vaccine. I mean, the fact that the vaccine were developed so quickly and they were introduced by the end of last year already, and they proved to be effective, at least so far, of course, it created a very, very sort of a positive view about the post-pandemic recovery. And then, of course, there is the unprecedented monetary and fiscal policy launched by government, as uh, Professor Rogoff once again pointed out, that when you have a demand uh, collapse due, in this case, to reduce social mobility, it makes sense to, to use the, gazoo, the, the bazooka and throw everything you can 
in order to support demand at least until social mobility return. And to a certain extent, I would say that this has been uh, very effective. Now, uh, the question is, uh, now we have the new variant. We, we can see there are still uncertainty about how eventually this uh, type of uh, uh, developing the pandemic could impact uh, the economies. But in reality, if you look at financial markets, since this new variant, has uh, started to become uh, very visible, uh, which we are talking about really about a few weeks ago, apart from an initial sort of uh, moment of, uh, uh, of, I would say, emotional response to this news about the new variant, in reality, the market has stabilized. And uh, you can see some of the market, for instance, US equity market are very close to the highs. The view of the market is that this variant will not lead to new lockdown as we experienced before. And I believe this is based on two factors. One is probably this sort of a positivity bias that ultimately the third vaccine, the booster will provide a shield. Of course, we also look at the number in terms of hospitalization and death rates, which appear to be a little bit lower. And, to the, and if this is the case, even if this variant will increase the contagion very fast and very quickly, ultimately the impact on the economy will be relatively muted in the sense that the big recovery that we were experiencing in the last quarter of 2021 might be a little bit moved forward when eventually the situation will improve in the spring. Now, I think that uh, the fundamental fact, so the, we had a benign view since we moved into this pandemic, and this benign view uh, about the outlook has, been, uh, re has remained pretty resilient as well, more in the final part of the year as we fight this uh, new evolution in the pandemic. I think there is one factor as well which the market has been looking very closely, which is, of course, the fact that we are entering, we, uh, we are coming out of this pandemic eventually when we will, with a very solid balance sheet of the, cons of the households and the corporate sector. And this is a huge difference in terms of what we experienced in 2008. I always remember at the time we were saying, we are living in a balance sheet recession. This was instead, the, this is the one that we live in 2020 was a demand recession due to the, so to the lockdown. And I think the recovery reflect that has been incredibly fast because uh, households found themselves with a relatively uh, good income, actually level of income in some countries have recouped very quickly the level of already of the pre-pandemic. And at the same time, the corporate sector also thanks uh, to the fiscal and monetary expansion and to all the measures launched by government to support demand have actually become, have remained pretty, pretty resilient. So from that, also another factor which makes us uh, uh, very, uh, in some way, positive about the strengths of the recovery is as well about the fiscal expansion. Is it true that probably the fiscal expansion, at least the big one, is behind us? But we should not forget that there is no real talking of austerity here. We don't hear a lot of governments uh, jumping on the austerity wagon saying we need now to start a dra sort of a tightening because if not, we cannot put the debt under control. So this debate has not emerged yet. We should not forget instead that what happened, for instance, in Europe after the great financial crisis, 2012. We remember that uh, what, what happened there as well on the back of the austerity uh, discussion. Finally, point about the supply chain disruption. It, it is true, this is what is probably causing uh, uh, the inflation. I believe the market is probably underestimating the, the magnitude of this, uh, um, of this disruption, which probably will make inflation a little bit uh, more enduring. But I believe that, and I will come back uh, in a minute on that, that the debate on the inflation is not settled yet. I can see the point raised by Professor Rogoff about the fact that probably inflation will be a little bit more enduring, but still I think there is an ongoing debate about whether we're really moving into a new regime of higher inflation. I could come with a lot of reason why inflation will remain low. The sort of uh, some of the factors which we had the before the pandemic, demography, even globalization, etc., have been uh, are still there despite some headwinds. So why they should revert uh, and not revert, the, eventually they will continue uh, putting down the level of price as we move into the post-pandemic world. So uh, just to say, and then I will uh, address the two question of Mark very quickly, the, 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 we, are, we still believe that the, the, the recovery is going to be relatively strong despite the latest uh, uh, development in the pandemic, supported by the strong balance sheet of households and the corporate sector. 
this trans of course we see some issues about uh, uh, rising yields this is something completely new for many portfolio managers we should not forget many people who are in fixed income and never lived through an hiking cycle they never experienced over the last 20 years so this is going to be the first time that they see losses on fixed income portfolio. So this is going to be a very interesting development and I spend a lot of my time Thanks. You went to mute. Yeah. Apology, I touched myself at the screen. Oh, really? So very quickly in the interest of time, what where are the risks? Of course, if inflation turns out to be much higher and the Fed will be forced to high interest rate very aggressively, this will have an impact. There is no doubt about that. And the financial market know that. And every, and every hint that this increase in interest rate, which we expect next year, might be more, uh, might be sharper than what uh, the, the market is currently expecting will definitely have an impact. But I believe China is also a major factor here. China is definitely a factor which has been behind the growth of the last decade, two de few decades. We see China slowing down. Definitely, we, we see the real estate sector having an impact. If this impact will eventually be uh, stronger and larger than expected, and the, the government in China will fail to control that and to stabilize the economy, eventually the impact will be felt uh, globally. And of course, this will depend very much to what extent the strong growth that we expect in developed economies will eventually compensate for the slower structural growth in China. Now, three, 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 three points that I want to mention. I like what uh, Professor Rogov said about stagflation. When we, when we talk to investors about rising yield environment, there is a very big difference between high growth, high inflation, and uh, low growth, high inflation. And the reason is also very simple from a financial market perspective. Stagflation is what uh, kill a balanced portfolio. You lose money on both legs of your portfolio. There is no escape. You cannot protect your portfolio. So the diversification, which has been a fantastic strategy in the last few decades to navigate the difficult markets we have been in for a very long time, would not work. And that, of course, is what scares investors. So definitely, if we move into high growth, high inflation, I think it's going to be a more benign environment, at least from an investment perspective for the majority of investors compared to a stagflation one. Then the question of EM versus DM and the question of capital flows. It is very interesting, actually. If you look at China, and uh, we and of course putting into the context of the whole geopolitical tension between the US and China, trade war, the tech sector, repatriation of some uh, listed firms, in reality, we still see capital flows going into Chinese fixed income and equity price so far. We have not seen a reversal. And this is something which is very important to keep in mind because it's true, we are also debating about deglobalization. But if there is a pillar which so far has not be, has, uh, remained pretty resilient among the various pillars of uh, globalization, I believe capital flows is one of them. But that's something that, of course, can also eventually change in the future. And then the last point about inflation. This is a classical, when we go in a conversation with the majority of our clients, the question is always like, in which camp are you? Are you in the transitory inflation or you think we are moving into a new era of higher inflation? And of course, as I mentioned, we can, I tend to think in terms of scenario because I think that the answer nobody really knows. But for sure, uh, uh, there is a little bit more uh, over the last few months uh, shifted towards uh, the expectation of a more prolonged period of high inflation. But one uh, answer that I, uh, one of my portfolio manager gave uh, in a conversation we had that was very, which I found it very, very, very entertaining at least, was that, well, inflation is a little bit like dinosaurs. Eventually, dinosaurs <laughs> disappear from the earth, but they've been around for a very long time, which I found is a nice way to end uh, on a more dramatic note the debate about inflation, which for sure it is the most dominant one in the in the conversation with in, in, with investors around the world. I stop here in the interest of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Max. Thank you for this very good overview about the perspective from the financial market. You talk a lot about supply chain disruptions, so it's a good transition to ask um, Mr. Li Jinyan, you know, the chairman of the Silk Road Group and uh, UNTAD of the strategic direction. Clearly. 
uh, we have been seeing a quite spectacular rebound of global trade. And what we see, you know, uh, two weeks ago, we were talking to um, one of the um, uh, company involved in, uh, in the supply chain. And he said, look, the problem now is we have all the global feet in the water. The problem is when they arrive at the port and they cannot find workers. So let's try to understand, you know, this dynamic of supply chain disruptions and also why trade has been rebounding quite spectacularly. Over to you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, moder moderator, excellencies, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. So I would like to uh, answer this, you know, in the... Uh, you know, uh, in the angle of the uh, digital infra uh, the trading infrastructure and the, uh, you know, the, the, the international cooperation. So that's why I give the uh, speech of title is new order, a new order, new rules, and new system of the world trade with freedom, fairness, and integration, in integrity. And uh, this, I think, is the result to the, well, uh, the value of civilization. You know, the, the, uh, I give the prediction that the next civilization of the world will be the value civilization. According to the data from IMF, the, you know, the uh, global consumer price may raise 4.8 this year, which will be the fastest increase since 2007. High inflation become a symbol of economic recovery from the uh, pandemic. The continu continued global pandemic and the impact on the glo global economic remains major issue to the world. But we should find the solutions and uh, the dependence on foreign trade of many countries to, to raise trade balance between the countries become even more serious and risk and uh, accommodating. And the economic landscape is facing the challenges from reconstruction and tran transformation of the growth model. But I want to tell you that, you know, the now, because the emerging technologies like the internet, it's one of the minor, the, 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 the few technology, one of the few technologies that bring the great trans transformation to the world is intangible and in constant change. It's getting bigger and more complex every second, which had an impact on the economic and the, the daily life of, of the, the whole world. So uh, emergency technology such as the blockchain, 5G, cloud computing and big data have promoted the internet to the era of the value internet. You know, we are changing from the traditional internet to the value internet, transforming modern technologies, materials, value, ideas through the digital forms. That also you speed up the de development of the digital economy. So first we, we suggest we should improve in the global digital infrastructure. The COVID-19 pandemic created a crisis to the globe, but it should not be a crisis to the globalization. The economic globalization is irresistible trend and inevitable result of the con continuous development of the social economic and technology. The construction of the worldwide connectivity respect represents the general direction of the human society development. So the trade plays fundamental role in promoting the economic Global, globalization and, and, and is an important driving force for the process of the human society, especially recovery, recovery of the, the, the economic of the world. 
However, not until the recently, the, the tariffs, technology uh, backlist, financial isolations, economic uh, sanctions have become new weapons of mass you know, destructions. For them, the now they, 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 you know, the trade war or the trade, trade inflection between China and the United States. Behind all these street, uh, disputes, the distrust is the root cause of the problem. With you know, massive information held by this street network, data as a new media has become increasingly abundant and even rampant. How do you expect a trust mechanism, mechanism and achieve the digital <clears throat> convergency is an urgent issue. So that's why I think we think it's so important to improve the global digital infrastructure. You know, they, 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 we said, you know, the, the trading uh, infrastructure mainly, be, you know, consists of four one is trade floor, cargo floor, capital floor, and information floor. So, to enhance the construction, upgrading, upgrading, and improvements of the global digital infrastructure, especially the countries and regions with backward digital infrastructure, for example, the uh, African countries, you know, developing countries, the digital divide will be closed with the digital space created by the digital infrastructure promotes the cooperation and smoothness of the trade flow. This four floor I just mentioned, and fully release the potential and momentum of the digital economy. Second, you know, the building global credible trade system. This also become more and more important. China Secretary Group and United Nations Conference on the Trade and Develop Development, ANCTAD, share the same vision of substantial, <coughs> substantial sustainable uh, development of the global economy. That's why we, uh, after the serious discussion and negotiation we, in July 2019, both sides jointly launched the digital trading infrastructure and online dispute resolutions. So this project has become one of the important projects in the ANCTAD to promote the uh, e-commerce and cross-border trade. DO, we call this project as DODR. DODR project covers various digital technologies such as latest achievement of blockchain, building network and nodes, a digital trade in industry ecology in Europe, Asia, American, and the other regions. So this will provide the you know the eco opportunity for beneficial countries to integrate into the global trade and achieve inclusive trade and development. So this project jointly launched by, the, as I mentioned, China Sea Group and, and, and Chat. So we will have one, you know, we call trading le ledger chain. This is the blockchain based system. And uh, we jointly work, work you know, in different fields like the business, business floor, cargo floor, Capital flow, information flow, online dispute resolutions. Why we do this? Because you know consumers are the fundamental driving force for the development of cross-border trade and e-commerce. Due to the lack of the effective consumer dispute resolution and release of program, consumers are you know not, not easy for them to do all this. You know, at, especially at the uh, you know, a situation of the pandemic. So this, and that this is, uh, you know, uh, environment, this become more and more important. With the help of the TCL, the trade, the ledger chain in the digital trade infrastructure, DODI is able to build a whole process data storage, evidence collection platform for the cross-border e-commerce. It provides, consumers around the world with the low cost, fast, effective, 
effectively fair, transparent, and safe dis dispute resolution uh, solutions. All these were, you know, uh, will help the uh, consumer to buy online, you know, through the uh, this platform in different countries. So for this, we have the same vision that to establish a credible digital trading system based on the whole region, the whole process, the whole sense, and the whole value chain. Construct a new order, new roads, and new system with the freedom, fairness, and integrity. So by this, you know, we will promote the realization of the global trade and multi-trust in the connection multi-help and multi-benefit, especially to improve the su supply chain and uh, at the moment. The third, we know, we, uh, you know, call the whole world, we should strengthen the international cooperation to, co to achieve the common development. International co cooperation is the only way to strengthen the international connectivity, especially to solve the problem of supply chain and foster the common development of digital economic with the higher standard and viable applications. That's why we, you know, the end of the year of the 10th anniversary of the international project Global and uh, Global, together the, we, with the international secretary of the G Global, we opened the first Nasaratan Nadabrayev uh, Laboratory in Nanjing, China. So we were we were uh, open more, you know, uh, you know, Nadabrayev uh, Laboratory in China, even in other countries. This is the will be the open laboratory, uh, you know, technology research and innovation laboratory. Every we will invite the research organizations the universities from all of the world to join this. So this will, will help the international cooperation for the connectivities, for the joint developments. So, Mr. Yan, sorry, if you can conclude as uh, we have uh, yeah. we yes, have I know. time and we want at least to have one or two questions to the, to the okay, panel. Okay, okay. If you, okay, okay, please, yeah. sorry about that, please, if you can conclude, thank you. Yeah. Reshaping the then the fourth the reshaping the global value chain, you know the this also very important. You know why you know they they uh, share the technologies with each other, but also we should reshape this, and uh, we should you know with the spirit of the Silk Road, then you know the peaceful cooperation and the 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 the, the, the ODODR where you know the the as I mentioned. For ha have the uh, provide the platform for the international uh, cooperation, especially the, I want to say it's where leads industrial civilization to the value civilizations. As the the last, you know, assessing the high level of the event, I propose to hold the next international congress of the G Global in China next year. So this. We invite this, uh, you know, uh, conference into China. So thank you very much. So we appreciate for all these uh, participants, all the excellencies. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Yan, for uh, for your speech and also for the invitation of the organizer to join next year uh, in your country. Romano, I think you raise uh, your hand maybe for making a comment or question. No, no. Simply look. Uh, our your conversation raised only or mainly the financial and monetary problem, you know, but uh, really, uh, uh, if we could decide, we shall have inflation. Let's say this is the general game. Inflation with low growth or high growth. The problem that uh, we didn't tackle is the real problem of uh, economy of investment. You know, with the change of competition we have now, we shall have a great flow of investments to have some 
part of the value chain in any of the three big areas. And so we are clearly underestimating the future of this new flow of investment in order to have some sort of, uh, of uh, sufficient presence in the most important value chain. Now you have Intel, you have Tesla, you have investing in Europe and the reverse, you have another case. So this reorganizing of the supply chains in the world uh, connected with, a, uh, uh, let's say, with a high demand that we have now compared to supply will push to think that uh, a high level of inflation will be compatible with a high level of growth. But uh, <laughs> this is only, you know, real uh, th thing that I am trying to study now because it's quite new connected also with, the, but uh, has been very well analyzed with the total new policy of the different governments compared, compared to previous crises. But this has been very, very deeply analyzed. Thank you, Romano. Indeed, you know, we are moving toward a more resilient and more strategic supply chain. And we are shifting also from uh, just in time versus just in case. I think this is also something yeah. happening at the global yeah. level, you know. Definitely. But this needs this needs investments, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Huge investment also for the new climate strategy. And uh, nobody has put this this in the blackboard, you know. And uh, I think that this is uh, the problem number one because it's not only a recovery but is a, a productive revolution inside the recovery. Thank you. Any comments from our other speakers before I give the floor uh, to our organizer? Uh, any comments or... Uh, yes, Bauer, please, quickly. Yeah, thank you. No, just very quick. I think uh, one important aspect that we haven't had the chance to discuss is the technology and how that could help us because with the supply chain, I think we digitize good to transform to services uh, that will help hopefully with the transition because currently the price, the investment into the renewables is very expensive for many countries, especially when they have the cheap alternative as coal. But hopefully with the, um, uh, with, as we move forward, that will become more cheaper. So we have to spend some time, some money on research and development. I think we have to keep that in mind. And that should be on the policymakers agenda as well. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment? Ken, if I may ask you a question, you know, you talk, ah, sorry, Max, please. No, please, please, please go ahead with Ken. I can comment afterwards. Absolutely. Please go ahead with your question to Ken. If you reflect about inflation, you know, there have been a lot of discussions about this debate about transitory versus permanent, but I wanted to ask you about labor market. You know, is there something happening in the labor market, uh, not only in the US, but also in Europe that also can trigger the second round effect of inflation. You know, do you see something really more structural happening in the labor market in the US? Well, there's certainly profound changes in the labor market that I think my labor uh, economist colleagues don't completely understand. I mean, certainly the pandemic has pushed people to retire uh, a little earlier in the United States, maybe a lot earlier in some cases. Uh, but there are, ma there are many other effects that are hard to separate out what's permanent and transitory. We have many, uh, many families where both spouses work. And I think in uh, a great many, there's been a decision made to have one spouse work instead of both for a long period. And, and, and not just because of income, but because watching what's going on in the schools, you you could actually see what your children are learning. And many parents, I think, have, you know, reevaluated how much time they want to put in directly with their children. I just give that as an example. There are many people who did, I would say, more marginal jobs, low wage jobs, who, you know, rethought their lives, uh, went back to school, decided to do something else. There, there, there are really some profound transitions of so the, the labor force has not come up to where it was. 
we've seen that in, in, in many countries. Now, you know, how much is this directly affecting inflation? Uh, for sure, it should have some effect. I must say, until now, wages have not kept up with inflation in, you know, the median worker. It's really quite remarkable. And if we ask what's next, uh, I think there's certainly at least this possibility that you see wages not just going up to make up for inflation as workers push for that, not just unions, but workers in general, but wages anticipating that inflation might continue. I think it's one thing for you know, a professional investor to you know, look at the data and make a decision. I think for a lot of consumers, they look at gas prices and that's how they think about inflation or something very simple. And, and, and so there, there's certainly a concern that this inflation dynamic, which we have never really understood why inflation was so low, uh, could change. The labor market is, is a piece of this. Um, I, I might just add at a global level, the, um, the, the fact that one of the big, uh, some of the big drivers in uh, pushing down inflation, I think, were the huge growth of the global labor force, of course, famously China, India, but also uh, uh, Central Europe, Eastern Europe has really brought a lot of people into the labor force. They are aging. And so demographics, which may have for a period uh, helped push down inflation, we could be going into another point in the cycle, as I'm sure you know, uh, Charles Goodhart uh, had, had a book about this. Uh, I, I wrote something about this 15 or 20 years ago. Great. Thank you. Max, um, final word to you before I give the floor to the organizer, Seri. No, 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 not definitely the final word, but uh, j just a comment uh, on uh, what uh, Professor Prodi mentioned that uh, the question of the international value chain uh, globalization, I think it is one of another of this area where it is very difficult to really make a, a strong statement in one direction or in another. I mean, everybody's uh, saying that globalization has stalled, that we are probably in deglobalization. But in reality, if you look at very closely the data, the data is not telling us that. We, at least we don't see a dramatic drop in the fundamental pillars of globalization, international trade, the capital flows. Maybe is the only area is labor market, labor movement because of the pandemic where we really see a, a strong slowdown. So, and the, so, so that, that's one aspect because I think this is also very important for the question of inflation because the dynamics of inflation and globalization, I think they are very much linked. And uh, it might well be that if we really are going into deglobalization, then really inflation might really go up dramatically if this was the main driver of deflation in the previous 20, 30 years. But the question of technology for me, it is very, very important. I was, to, this morning I was in another webinar where we were talking about uh, digitization, uh, digital currency, tokenization, Think about Europe and the capital markets uh, uh, union, which is probably one of the unfinished job of Europe, which has not allowed Europe to really take advantage as the US does of, his, of deep capital markets. Technology might be a game changer here. Think about uh, the issuance of bonds, the parcelization or uh, the fact that you can reach out uh, with bonds with different type of uh, financial tools an audience which before was simply not reachable. So it might well be that digitization and technology could provide us with a fantastic opportunity to address some of these investment needs that Professor Prodi raised before from uh, the value chain, but also think about sustainability, etc. So I just want to mention that this, uh, the, the interconnection between uh, globalization, technology, inflation, labor market, and international value chain, it is a fascinating area of research where I'm sure the answer is there. The question is to find the, the right answer because the data are very difficult to read sometimes. Sorry, so it's just a comment, really. Thank you. Thank you very much. Governor, any final comment before I give the no? Perfect. Well, thank you, all of you. Let me now give the floor to the organizer of this conference, uh, the head of the International Secretariat, Serik Nugarbekov. Serik, uh, thanks so much for hosting us. I'm going to give you the floor and also take this opportunity to congratulate you and your country because this is your 30 years of anniversary of independence. Over to you, Serik. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. First of all, on behalf of the organizers, I'd like to thank all the participants of our forum. First of all, let me avail myself of this opportunity. G Global congratul uh, celebrates the 10th anniversary today. Ten years ago, the first president of the Republic of Kazakhstan, Nursultan Zarbayev, announced uh, this project, the main task of our project to consolidate efforts of uh, practitioners and experts of all countries to conduct uh, prevention efforts for anti-crisis measures. I am delighted that today uh, Mr. Litsin offered to us to organize the third G Global Congress in China next year. And also, thank you so much for Mr. Yan Litsin for opening laboratory in Nanjing city. Uh, the key goal of laboratory is to resolve the issues of uh, digitalization using blockchain and transport infrastructure. We have a crisis right now, COVID crisis and transport links are being disrupted. And Kazakhstan serves as a bridge between uh, the largest economies of the world, economies of China and Europe, and using new technologies, uh, blockchain t digitalization are necessary to ensure the sustainability of transport links. Uh, by the end of uh, next year, we will plan, we plan to open the second laboratory in Changsha City. Uh, and I I hope that the businesses of other world, other countries will support the initiative of Mr. Yan Litsin. World um, is going through a significant moment. Innovations are being expanded. As experts say, capitalization of largest uh, technical companies amounts to $7 trillion, and by 2030, it will amount to 280 trillion dollars. Those are new technologies and in this situation we as organizers of this platform uh, Eurasian Economic Club of uh, Scientists who is the main organizer and administration of G Global Project and international G Global Project. Um, our main task is to consolidate efforts of politicians, scientists, representatives of business to consolidate our efforts and develop recommendations and our recommendations will help state departments, businesses and that this will be reflected in increase in taxes, uh, increase of well-being of our citizens. Thank you so much for your participation in our event. Following the event that Mr. Yan Litsin uh, will help to organize by providing a platform, I'd like to request Mr. Mark Uzan so we prepared recommendation for a G20 group uh, international anti-crisis conference that was supported by the General Assembly of United Nations. And you all supported us back then, especially Marco Zahn. In 2014, we man managed to um, gather uh, business representatives, uh, academia, uh, and politicians of 140 countries, and we developed um, the anti-crisis plan. And uh, over five, six years, we've been developing recommendations for G20 group that um, Sir Pan Ki Moon uh, presented at G20 forum. 
that was possible because of our consolidated efforts and I'd like to request Mr. Orkosan, maybe we should start preparing the third Congress G Global, the world of 21st century, so we could, as Mr. Marcosan remembers in 2014, uh, we, to create online platform and to prepare our events online and over nine months to develop recommendations and involve a, a broader circle of experts to our work and utilize platforms and laboratories, Nazarbayev laboratories in China, such laboratories, maybe such laboratories will be established in, new in other countries use this platform to consolidate consolidate our efforts and uh, I hope uh, the colleagues present will be involved uh, in this work and thank you so much uh, for participation in this event. Thank you, thank you very much. So I think it is, uh, thank you uh, Sherry for the conclusions. Let me thank on behalf of the organizer, all our speakers for joining today, morning or afternoon, wherever you are. I'm looking forward to seeing you in person hopefully next year. And I thank this opportunity to wish you happy holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. And I look forward uh, for better 2022. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay.